If you're a Cartoon Network fan, chances are you know that the company is no stranger to crossovers. It was one of the most fun things to watch on Cartoon Network when I was growing up in the late 90s to mid 2000s. From seeing my favorite Cartoon Network franchises meet in Cartoon Network City to things as crazy as Cartoon Network appearing on Nickelodeon. We have crossovers with Lego games, Minecraft, and even the return of Cartoon Network's most beloved era. There's a lot to unpack here, and I think you're going to like it. So grab yourself a snack and let's dive into 27 years of Cartoon Network crossover history. And what better way to start than with Space Ghost Coast to Coast? Say that 10 times fast. I dare you. I've had to re-record this part like 100 times. Cartoon Network's first original series that was fully produced by Cartoon Network. Every time I move my arm, it cost the Cartoon Network 42 bucks. <laughs> it premiered on April 15th, 1994, and originally ended on December 17th, 1999. The series was later revived in May 7th of 2001, and then it was moved to the new Adult Swim late night programming block on September 2nd. And that's where the new episodes premiered going forward. So I felt the need to include Space Ghost Coast to Coast due to its overall impact on Cartoon Network as a whole. But with it being technically an Adult Swim series, I'm not going to go into detail about all the crossovers that it specifically had. But here's me reading all the crossovers that it had at 10x speed. Moby Dick and the Mighty Murder, The Hercules, Shazam, Sonic, Mystery Science Theater 3000, Elvira, The Red Green Show, Dr. Cat, Professional Therapist, Fairly Odd Parents, Johnny Bravo, Insurance, Cartoon Network, Punch Private Explosions, Batman, Wacky Races, and Me Tunes. You're watching Scooby-Doo on Cartoon Network. From here, we kick off the Cartoon Network crossover universe with an incredible crossover for Johnny Bravo and Scooby-Doo. And it's pretty much everything you could want and more out of a crossover between these two specific shows. The episode Bravo Doobie Doo opens up with Johnny's car broken down on the side of the road, and the mystery machine pulls over to check on him. The gang asks where he needs to be, and he tells them that his aunt's haunted mansion is where he's trying to go, and obviously that gets their attention, they get all jazzed, they invite him in, and oh my god, it is just magical. Don't worry, I don't bite. Does she? Oh. Hey, Scoob, dig this guy's crazy hairdo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Velma clearly has a crush on Johnny, but Johnny is completely focused on Daphne, and Shaggy and Scooby are just fascinated by Johnny's hairdo. After getting to Johnny's aunt's house, which clearly could use some maintenance, there also doesn't seem to be anyone home. But then a ghostly voice shouts. <laughs> And Johnny is not scared in the slightest, but of course, he uses the opportunity to his advantage because, well, he, he's Johnny Bravo. What, what did we expect? Now, it clearly did not work, but Shag and Scooby are clearly already done, but the gang isn't going to leave this mystery unsolved. The episode's not over. Come on. They search the house for Aunt Jebedissa, but... Get out! Zoich, a ghostly gardener! pops out of the closet, and Velma and Johnny lose their glasses. And a remarkably funny, it just, it just watch. My glasses, I can't see without my glasses. My glasses, I can't be seen without my glasses. Jankies, everything's dark, I've gone blind. I'm only gonna say this once. Don't touch the glasses. They end up searching the closet, and shocker, there's no ghost, but there is a clue. The ghost be covered in flour. Easy, silly, because it's not a ghost. You understand what that dog says? Sure, we all do. Johnny continues to fail at getting Daphne's attention, and I think we even get a little jealousy from Fred here, maybe? Or they're just gonna bang. Let's be honest, they're just going to bang. So the homie squad goes off to the kitchen together, and of course, they run into the ghost. And although they did their best to hide in a barrel, didn't work out too well, we get a typical chase scene. Well, kind of. Now, uh, hold on, everybody. All righty. 
They run into Velma not long after, and Johnny is still on this jinkies thing. Oh, and Fred breaks the fourth wall to really let us know they are going to bang. So Fred's about to hit, Johnny's losing his underwear, helps capture the fake ghost, who's wearing I, I, a lot of masks, count them if you want to. But it turns out, it was... Holy Aunt Jebediza, it was you all along. But, but why? And then it gets kind of mean, I'm not gonna lie. She admits she was trying to scare Johnny away because she doesn't like him. He's an embarrassment to the family name. She is just roasting him. And then to top all of that off, the gang sides with Aunt Jebedissa. Oh man, this rope is really binding my pits. And after all that, she tries to shag Shaggy. So I guess they really are family. And then the sentient car shows up to pick up Johnny Bravo. Our second crossover is the episode I Am My Lifetime from the show, I Am Weasel. And the episode is honestly a really cool idea that in my opinion just was not executed well, but is also a much shorter episode, so they didn't have as much to work with. The premise is an elderly I Am Weasel rocking in a rocking chair, the old cartoon star's home. And we get a solid cast of characters from this era of cartoons. Of yesteryear spend their golden years. Guys like cow and chicken. Elderly boy genius Dexter of laboratory fame. Good old doggy daddy. That ingrate retired teenager Johnny Quest. And of course, everyone's favorite horse, Quick Draw McGraw. So I Am Weasel is having a pretty damn good retirement, but I Are Baboon, not so much. He's chilling at the old cartoon sidekick home, where we got characters like... It is users like Buddy, Boo Boo, Old Pebbles, and Old Bam Bam, Haji, and Ricky Baba Lewis. You know, all iconic characters in their own right. Again, I Are Baboon, not so much. Boo Boo talks a little smack and says he should be in... The old cartoon villain's asylum. <laughs> Here we've got Ranger Smith, who mean Mr. Slate, and me, the red guy. <laughs> and then we get a bit of Boo Boo mocking IR Weasel, which I was hoping would continue throughout the episode, but it really just doesn't, unfortunately. Instead, we get IR Baboon telling his life story about how much better I Am Weasel is than him in pretty much everything, which we already knew. Five seconds in between each story, you get him, like, talking at other characters a little bit, not really. Even after his stories are over, he just storms up to the cartoon star's home, yeets Johnny Quest, and then accidentally puts on I Am Weasel's dirty diaper by mistake, just like in his first story about when he was a baby. And that's it. The episode ends. Now, it's not a bad crossover episode necessarily, it's fine as a small little nod to these old characters, but I think it's the expectations the episode sets that's the main issue here. It's an awesome premise to have this many famous characters getting to interact with one another in one episode as if they're in a retirement home. It would allow for a ton of really cool interactions and moments, but instead we pretty much got zero dialogue and just IR Baboon taking L's for six minutes. Yeah, I said Baboon, deal with it. I mean, this is the only piece of dialogue from any of the older characters during the entire episode. I are not belonging in old sidekick trailer. I don't think he belongs here either. I think they should lock him up in the old cartoon villains asylum. It just feels like a missed opportunity and with it being only about six minutes long, I understand they didn't have much time to work with, but it's just a huge bummer because this was such a missed opportunity. Now, it's not the last time we'll see all these characters, luckily, but it's definitely a weaker crossover than the last. Thank you, thank you. No, no, you're really too kind. Really, no, this is too much. The next I Am Weasel crossover is with Cow and Chicken in an episode called I Are in the Wrong Cartoon. 
Now, Cal is just absolutely swooning over I am Weasel, and who can blame her? But Red Guy shows up and promises Cal that he can help her get I am Weasel. Cal's explaining that Weasel's just a cartoon, but Red Guy insists you just need to fish him out of the TV using pie. And it works! I'm a big fan of pie. Cow actually manages to fish Weasel out of the TV with the help of Red Guy, and Cow is just the happiest girl in the world. Now, after eating a ton of pies, they turn on the TV to see what IR Baboon is up to, and you guessed it, it's being gross and annoying as usual. <laughs> So IR Baboon realizes his life is meaningless and starts freaking out, which makes Weasel realize he needs to go back. Although he's struggling because, well, he's massive now from all the pies. And somehow IR Baboon just shows up at the front door. Now, I don't know if he went through another TV or if they're secretly in the same universe, but it's just a fun little crossover if you're a fan of I Am Weasel or Cow and Chicken, even though there's no chicken in this episode. Computer, continue transmission of Dexter's laboratory on Cartoon Network. From here, we dive into Dexter's Laboratory and its crossover with one of Hanna-Barbera's older series, Dynamut Dog Wonder. Now, this episode brought a flood of nostalgia back for me, even though I never grew up watching Dynamut. There's just this vibe with Hanna-Barbera cartoons where it just feels like you're committing a sin by not watching on a CRT TV. So in this episode, Dexter is being harassed by Dee Dee yet again, and she gets stuck in these pipes. But suddenly, the doorbell rings. Blue Falcon, who's one of the protagonists of Dino Mutt Dog Wonder, shows up to Dexter's home during a dark and stormy night. And his buddy Dino Mutt, well, he has seen better days, to say the least. Dexter obviously decides to help, and we learn this buzzard-looking head ass is the culprit that hurt our precious dino mutt. His minions may have survived his perfect pizza pounding attack, and they also survived this. But in the end, he was turned into this. By a dude who the Falcon literally one-shot, by the way. So, you know, I think it's clear here who's to blame. So Dexter brings Dino Mutt back to life, and then he proceeds to completely decimate Dexter's lab. I'm not kidding. So Dexter pulls the plug like he's trying to collect that inheritance and just yeets him into a cardboard box. Guess I better start from scratch. I'd like to present Dino Mutt X90. I see you've added a few things. So first off, not only did our lovable Dino Mutt go from, you know, his lovable self to, well, this, he's also massive and bulletproof. That's right, we got guns in children's cartoons. So the new Dino Mutt is feeling himself, he's on the force, he just saved a man from getting mugged and got a dangerous criminal off the street. So what he gunned down little Billy for jaywalking? So what he burned Tiny Tim to a crisp for littering? You win some, you lose some, nerds. Dexter teams up with Blue Falcon after this, and they manage to stop the evil Dino Mutt from, you know, killing a little girl. But he then turns on Blue Falcon. Not that way. Stop being weird. And Dexter finally reveals to him that this isn't actually Dino Mutt. It's a new one that he created, not the actual original. The old one was just a goofy idiot sidekick. He wasn't just a goofy idiot sidekick. He was a go-go dog person. And this new knowledge allows Blue Falcon to remotely reboot Dino Mutt, who then shows up to fight. And the new Dino Mutt, the evil one, it doesn't even classify him as a threat. So the OG Mutt turns into a cat to distract him and then tricks him into eating a bomb disguised as a bone, which explodes and allows Dexter to deactivate the evil Dino Mutt and the day is saved. And Blue Falcon gives some really wise words. And remember, Dexter, it's a goofy idiot sidekick that makes a superhero super. Wow, cool. Yep. And Dexter grabs Dee Dee's hand 
and they hobble back inside. It's a fun crossover that I enjoyed a ton, even without ever watching Dino Mutt, but some of these next ones are just so much better. It took three years from that Dexter's episode, but we are on to my personal favorite era of Cartoon Network and arguably the greatest era of Cartoon Network ever, the 2000s. I know Courage and the Powerpuff Girls did release in the late 90s, I know, but they did bleed into the 2000s and none of their crossovers happened before the 2000s, so I'm classifying them as era two. So this Powerpuff Girls episode, Members Only, is a Dexter's Lab crossover, but it was released in the 2000s, so I don't want to hear it. The episode opens up with the Powerpuff Girls rushing home to watch the live coverage of the Association of World Supermen, or Awesome for short. But hold up, let's not ignore the tanks on the highway, the gigantic monster, and that ass! So the awesome event has a ton of insane heroes. We have a bunch of stereotypes for various parts of the world. And then we have the king. Caribbean Crusader, the Atlantean Lion. Yama. And this dude is baked. But the stereotypes aren't over, baby. It's time for America personified. Mr. Red, White, and Blue, Mr. Fourth of July, Captain Colonizer. Oh, wait, my bad, wrong name. The AWSM founder and chairman, America's favorite son, the captain of capitalism, Major Glory. Hi, kids. Where's my action figure? So Major Glory kicked out the reporters and the Powerpuff Girls are geeking out and imagining all the incredible things they must talk about at the Super Summit 2000. And they feel they're not super enough to go. But Dad of the Year, Professor Utonium, gasses up the girls and motivates them by telling them all the times that they've saved the world and that they deserve to be at the summit. And I agree. So the girls take his advice and they take off. They arrive right after roll call and Major Glory and the rest of the superheroes just start giggling, except for the two chads in the back. Wait, wait a minute. That is Space Ghost coast to coast from the beginning of the video. See the homie Space Ghost ain't here to mock three little girls, unlike Major Glory, who's honestly just being a total dick right now. I can wrap my head around being a little skeptical of three little girls showing up and claiming to be superheroes. That makes sense to me but they literally did smash through the door while flying. By motion, we proceed with... Hi! So clearly, they have powers. So everyone but Space Ghost is mocking the girls. Gentlemen, shall we let the sugar puffs give it a go? Of course, they let them have yeah. a go. He thinks that would be most humorous. <laughs> it's test time, baby, and Buttercup absolutely obliterates Big Ben by just showing him up in the strength contest over and over again. Even after he almost bursts, she lifts him and what he's lifting with ease, just a little sweat. And at this point, Major Glory and the rest are starting to take notice of the girl's performance, but they still seem to think it might be a fluke. So now it's time for Bubbles to do a lap around the world against this guy, who I'm pretty certain is literally called Email. Caboodles versus Email! Wow. Yeah, you tell me what you think you heard. He gets a head start and, well... Um, excuse me, am I just supposed to keep up with you or is someone supposed to win? Oh, one of us should definitely win. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so on to test three. You know, a test of strength, a test of speed, a test of protecting the entire globe from an asteroid shower. So Blossom and Major Glory are off, and this dude is just a dick. I don't even think I could relay his sass levels myself, so let's just watch the clip. I'll be grading your performance and, you know, save the Earth if you can hack it. <laughs> oh, watch it, dear. Here they go. And Blossom just absolutely crushes it and does a damn good job. She fights off a bunch of the asteroids, and when the big one comes flying past, she collects herself, comes up with a plan, and executes it flawlessly. 
and it is such an incredible action sequence too, and just shows how absolutely busted the Powerpuff Girls truly are. Especially when Major Glory gets what he deserves. Watch out, there's still one left! So obviously they passed with flying colors and everyone is just being a bunch of sour pusses. Like, yo, I'm sorry you all got shown up by literal children and you too, Space Ghost? Really? I thought you were cool, man. At least now I know I made the right decision glossing over your crossovers. But to top it all off, it's not the denial that's just pathetic. It's how Major Glory acts towards the girls after. This is the Association of World Supermen. You are little girls. You should be at home with your mommy learning how to cook and clean and blah, 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 whatever women stuff. It's just a sexist rant that isn't really shocking for the time the show was released, but they make him look so pathetic throughout. It is amazing. It's not just like casual sexism for the lulls. Like it feels like they're actually pointing out how dumb being sexist is by making this superhero look like a jackass while being shown up by literal children. It's just such a funny moment and when Major Glory starts explaining how men and women have different roles and the girls just keep answering his questions with our dad over and over again, he becomes so confident and we get to just watch it ripped away and I actually lost it. Who goes to work and brings home the paycheck? Our dad. Right! Who pays the rent and puts the bread on the table? Our dad. Bingo! And who cooks the meals? Our dad. Who does the laundry? Dad. Who washes the dishes? Dad. And so what does your mother do? We don't have a mother. So yeah, they're kicked out. The girls are super sad, obviously, but a giant supervillain, Maskumax, shows up to test their manhood. The girls come home sad and we get to see all of these manly men getting absolutely beaten like sick dogs. The show's words, not mine. And of course, the Powerpuff Girls who aren't garbage human beings go to save them just as Maskew Max is what I can only assume here is telling everyone he's turned on and his dick is rock hard from beating the shit out of them. I I'm telling you, that's what he's saying here. So Maskew Max gotta toss the sexism card at the girls right away, obviously. And he absolutely gets the ever-loving shit beat out of him. It wasn't even close. And it, it was like super easy, dude. Like not close at all. Now I've talked about the Powerpuff Girls on the channel before. And they are not invincible by any means. But clearly they are insanely strong. And to just have even more fun playing with their food... They just become a giant fire cat and burn this dude alive. And then they send him literally crying home to his mommy. Mommy, there was some girls and they beat me. And after all of that, the guys finally accept that the girls are better than the boys. Powerpuff Girls and the newly formed Society of Associated Puffketeers. Aren't they cute little muffins? Every show is a cross-dressing episode. Seriously, look it up. They all do. Every single one. Anyways, this isn't the last time we got Dexter's Lab cameos in the Powerpuff Girls either. In fact, there's quite a few of them. Now, sadly, there was another three-plus year gap here before the next crossover episode. But this did begin one of the most iconic and memorable crossovers of Cartoon Network history. Cartoon Network City which debuted on June 14th of 2004. At last, proof of UFOs. Like that old ghost is here somewhere. <laughs> and if you're like me, this was your era of Cartoon Network. I'm not saying it's necessarily the best. Oh, who am I kidding? It was clearly the best. And to prove my point, we're going to check out another bumper right now. <laughs> oh, I know I had them. Hello, Professor. Do you have car trouble? Oh, it seems I've locked my keys in the car. That is serious. Gee! 
is. Well, I... Is there a problem, Professor? Oh, hello, number one. I seem to have locked myself out of my car. And now he is out of cheese. <gasps> Crackers! I'll need some two-by-fours. I'll be right back. Bring more cheese! It's no problem. I'll just call my auto club. <laughs> How many geniuses does it take to unlock a car door? <laughs> Hey, Brainiac. Did you try the door? <laughs> Silly me. Uh, thanks, Mandy. Whatever. Right. Does anyone have some nails? Not long after Cartoon Network City began, we were given another Johnny Bravo crossover with the Flintstones, of all things. The episode opens up with little Susie absolutely just shitting on Johnny. Johnny Bravo viewed by modern woman as barbaric, indeed primitive. And now we're in the Flintstones universe and Fred saves Johnny after he almost gets run over by a car because he's delirious because he was just beaten in the head by a prehistoric woman, just like he does in modern times. Also, did you have any idea Pebbles grew up? Because I didn't and Johnny Bravo hitting on Fred's adult daughter was definitely not on my bingo card for this video. Now, this did send me down a rabbit hole because I had no idea that Pebbles had grown up. I didn't know this was a thing. So I went down this rabbit hole and I probably would have been better off not knowing this, but adult Pebbles is in fact a thing. There's actually two Flintstone spinoffs, the Pebbles and Bam Bam TV show and I Yabba Dabba Do, the TV movie. Now, as you can clearly see here, this Pebbles that is in the Johnny Bravo crossover is clearly the Pebbles from the Bam Bam show and not the Pebbles from I Yabba Dabba Do. Now in the Pebbles and Bam Bam show, Pebbles is 15. In I Yabba Dabba Do, she is 20. Johnny Bravo is in his early 20s. So yeah, Johnny, maybe calm the hell down, Johnny. You trying to go to jail, Johnny? She's 15 years old, Johnny. Granted, that was beyond common back then, let's be real. And I'm talking about prehistoric times, not, you know, 2004. So obviously and thankfully, Johnny doesn't swoon Pebbles, but instead gets roped into paying Fred back for saving his life. And apparently, Johnny's life is only worth 20 different chores. It's honestly not a bad deal. To, to, I mean, let's be real. That's, that's, that's a goddamn steal right there. But of course, instead, Bravo decides he needs to save Fred's life to get out of this quicker. And he proceeds to make things worse. Over. And over. And over again. Fred and Johnny both come to the exact same plan to get out of the agreement. Bravo gets screwed by someone as creepy as him. Hey, where's my pterodactyl? Oh yeah, Barry! I rented him out. What? <laughs> but you said you'd save your best pterodactyl for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Some hot chick wanted him. And you know, you can't say no to the ladies. And yet again, makes the situation worse. And Pebbles manages to save the day, which causes Johnny to get creepy towards the underage Pebbles again. So Fred has Johnny chased out of town by Dino. Oh, Daddy. Prehistoric Johnny. Ironic or just plain duh? I'd say yabba dabba duh. Now Johnny Bravo came swinging in his final season too because that same exact month we got another Johnny Bravo crossover. <laughs> Look at that hair. <laughs> Talk about a dweeb. <laughs> Then you know what we must do, what we are sworn to do. What only we, Weird Al Yankovic, Don Knox, and myself, the Blue Falcon, can do. That's right. The whole point of this episode is Weird Al, Blue Falcon, and Don Knotts are giving Johnny a makeover to spice up his show. Which felt a little messed up since this is, from what I can tell, the second to last episode of the series. Now, the makeover makes absolute zero difference and Johnny just gets beat up multiple times throughout the episode. Eventually Blue Falcon and Don Knot start doing some magical shit. This episode just keeps getting weirder and weirder. Don't worry, it's almost over. Just one last touch. And the makeover squad shows the new show to a few kids who cry and don't like it. So they just move on, fly off to give the Powerpuff Girls a makeover so we get that little name drop at least. And the craziest part about this is the following episode aired the same exact day where Johnny Bravo met Shaq. And that is the finale. Johnny Bravo ended with these crossovers. And to keep the hype and momentum going, 
Cartoon Network actually got a little sneaky and they snuck this advertisement I'm about to show you onto Nickelodeon in 2004. Hurry up, we're not even supposed to be on this channel. Cartoon Network is. Ooh, hey, pretty mama. Johnny! Oh, the Cartoon Network's got this thing wrong. It's called Cartoon Cartoon Fridays, and we're on it. Hurry up! Okay! These are our shows. All your favorite cartoon cartoons back-to-back -back with a new episode every Friday. Uh, they're on Fridays at 7 over on Cartoon Network. You might like to switch over there now. Somebody's coming! We'll see you over there. Hey! <laughs> oh, dear. How they did that, I have no idea, but it is amazing. Now on to Cartoon Network City. The adult has infiltrated the outer perimeter with some sort of ridiculous armored transport. Unload the cheese on it. <laughs> right before Halloween the same year, Codename Kids Next Door dropped their two-part Halloween special. The first part was Operation Tricky, and was a dedicated Halloween episode that was honestly a ton of fun, and I highly recommend checking it out. And part two was Operation Uncool, which is more horror-themed episode than Halloween, but the premise is simple. A group of K&D operatives are dealing with zombies, and their commander, number 78, sacrifices herself so number 34 and number 42 can escape. But then this happens. We are leaving now! <laughs> now he manages to activate the escape ship to save his comrade, and we even get to see a Dexter balloon on top of the ship. We then cut to our main KND crew playing some card game, before running into our Dexter's Lab balloon ship. You left number 78 behind? I'm sorry, Hoagie. There was nothing I could do. So yeah, the KND crew is set off to Sector Z, alongside number 42, to try and save number 78 from the zombies. Or are they? This was also a super, super fun episode, but since the Dexter balloon is the only crossover aspect of this episode, we're gonna continue on, especially since these episodes are probably better suited for a Halloween theme video. Summer lineup on Cartoon Network is hotter than ever with all new episodes of Hi Hi Puppy on the Yumi. Billy and Mandy. Who's ready for fun? Plus, we've got the premiere of two new shows, Camp Laszlo and the Life and Times of Juniper Lee. It's go time! So come on over for Cartoon Network Summer. Next for Era 2, we have one of my favorite cartoons from Cartoon Network, The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. It's you and me against the world. We attack at dawn. My Fair Mandy is our first of four Billy and Mandy crossover episodes. That's right, we got a few, but not every one of them is a full-blown crossover. Much like the last K&D episode, this episode's crossover only happens at the very end. So let's recap quick and get to the crossover moment. The episode is about Mandy deciding to enter a beauty pageant because of three reasons. One, Mindy is fucking trash. Two, her creepy principal wants her to for some weird reason. And three, because every single cartoon ever needs a beauty pageant episode. So it goes as you'd expect. Grimm brings an old toothpaste head ass looking chick from the underworld and they basically all just mock Mandy for being hideous, but she's determined to make Mandy look beautiful because apparently this is beautiful, I guess. Oh, just a moment. Where was I? Oh yes, true beauty lies within. And how does it all turn out? Oh my word. I feel ridiculous. You are ridiculous! Ridiculously beautiful! 
Well, Mandy got her makeover now, but she refuses to smile. So that's not going too well. And at this point, it's all coming down to will Mandy smile. If she smiles, she apparently can win. But if she doesn't, she's going to lose. Erwin's also the only person cheering Mandy on. And who knows? Maybe he's what caused this because Mandy finally smiles and shatters freaking reality. So now Grim, Billy, and Mandy are now the Powerpuff Girls. Girls, girls, get up! Mojo Jojo just snuck into a movie theater without paying! We're on it, Professor. Okay. We keep flying, we never head back, we never talk about this again. Yep. Uh-huh. And I know that part is super short and it's barely a crossover, but I absolutely love this. Don't get me wrong, I definitely prefer the full-blown crossover episodes, and oh, do we have some incredible ones coming up. But I do wish that we would have had more short ones like these past two episodes just to fill in these gaps. We generally will get one crossover a year, maybe two, and then random chunks of two to four years with none for whatever reason. Although with Cartoon Network City going on, every time an episode ended, you basically got a crossover. The next Billy and Mandy crossover episode is weirdly enough with the Flintstones. It's a full dedicated episode and it's honestly a great episode, but it doesn't really feel like a crossover if that makes sense. It feels very hollow. Just bear with me. The episode is called Modern Primitives and it opens up with Billy digging a gigantic hole in his front yard. And let me tell you, he has an incredible reason for doing so. Cold out, so I'm digging to the center of the earth where it's warmer. Oh yeah, and he found Fred Flintstone, but not really. They defrost him against Mandy's great insight. I don't know what makes either of you think that releasing a caveman that's been frozen for thousands of years into the streets of a modern society is a good idea. Who knows how he'll react to being in a different time. And like I said, it's a funny episode of a caveman interacting with modern society. He destroys Billy's house, turns this record player into a record player using a bird. Billy rips the skin off his back, revealing his bones. Your typical Billy and Mandy stuff, not nah, for real. God, I love this show. So things are going well. He's learning to use utensils, Fred's vibing, until Billy locks him in a cage and brings him to school for show and tell. Yes, that actually happened. So Fred absolutely snaps and pulls this bat from what I can only assume is his prison pocket. He goes on a rampage, kidnapping the teacher for obvious reasons and fucked up reasons, let's be real. He does the Flintstones feet car thing and takes off with his new hostage, I mean wife. She then pulls an Uno reverse card and turns him into her hostage. I mean, ah uh, oh fuck, you know what I mean. He then crashes into an ice cream truck and gets refrozen. And to be honest, I think he did this on purpose. But sucks for Fred because he ends up even further in the future and ends up unfrozen alongside Billy and they eat his brain the end. 
So as I'm sure you noticed, you saw no dialogue from good old Fred here. He doesn't speak at all the whole episode. He says yabba dabba a lot, but he never even says yabba dabba do. Yabba dabba! <laughs> now, I can understand that as a caveman from prehistoric times, he might not speak English, and that's why it's all gibberish to Billy and us and, and whatnot. But I feel like they could have easily done some sort of moment where we get to actually hear Fred talk and say what he's thinking. And I feel like that really would have added to the dynamic and would make it feel more like a crossover. Using the part where Fred destroys Billy's house as an example, we could easily have him answer in gibberish when Billy's talking to him. And when Billy walks away, Fred could be, well, Fred. He could get frustrated with Billy for not understanding him, which then leads him to destroying the house out of frustration due to how annoying Billy is. It would still be on brand for Billy and Mandy, but would let you feel like it's actually Fred Flintstone. This version of him just felt more like random caveman dressed like Fred, like a cosplayer or something. And maybe I'm being too harsh on this episode, but with this being the final crossover before Cartoon Network City actually ended, it just feels like it could have been so much more. One time, my mom had a pet rat, and his name was Sniffles, and he was covered in snot, and looked like a tarred and feathered rat covered in snot, and my dad thought it was a badger covered in snot, so he ate it to protect my mom. My booger's itch! This is fun! This is fun! <laughs> this is fun! Cartoon Network. Yes! Yep. Cartoon Network City ended and the Yes era began. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss Cartoon Network City. But oh, it looks like we got something similar to Cartoon Network City returning this year. But we'll get to that in a little bit. For now, Evil Con Carne makes a return in this Billy and Mandy crossover. And now if you watched a lot of Billy and Mandy, you obviously know Scar is a fairly common character in the show. But he was originally part of Evil Con Carne, which was a part of Grim and Evil, which pretty much became the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. But this was a super fun episode to see finally happen. It does feel like less of a crossover in comparison to some of the others, but I think that's mostly since they've always been in the same world from the start. It's just not as shocking. Like, the show obviously evolved and changed. I mean, hell, it got a whole new name. But the worlds are still connected in a more direct way than some of the other shows on Cartoon Network. The episode opens up with Scar loving his garden, as usual. And here comes Billy to make his life hell, just like usual. I feel like I just dropped about 30 pounds. What did you do to my pansies? Also, Hector Concarne is back. Evil Concarne is back. And it's time for world domination. Scar swears he won't join them. And he fights back on it, pretty sternly. But after this... What? What do you want? I was bored, so I thought I'd come by and share my love. Get off of my property! Do I wax your head? My underwear smells! I did a nasty in your garden again. I'd be on board for world domination too. So they team up, but under these specific circumstances. Uh, but if you touch my garden, I'll hurt you. Escuche? Seriously, lay off my garden or I'll hurt you good. Things start to come to a boiling point way before anything could happen to his garden, though. They take up the bathroom, take over the TV, and generally, they just treat Scar like crap. And he's starting to regret his decision. But Billy gets him riled up yet again, and he's back onto his evil scheming. Hector reveals the rubber band tanks of doom have been created and world domination is in sight. It's happening. So they just start destroying Ensville, blowing holes in houses in the ground. It is complete destruction. Grim Scythe gets flown out of his hand and he just gives up and goes to watch TV. And now it's up to Billy and Mandy to save Ensville. So they bait Hector fairly easily, to be honest, into destroying Scar's garden and the infighting commences now. I'll kill you. I'll Get off of me! Get off! It wasn't my fault! The chief is gone! Let's get out of here! Evil Con Carne failed again. But as for the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy, not much has really changed. Come back here! Just put my hands on you! No one is 
Although the threat of an alien invasion is real, it appears to be not quite so menacing as originally thought. Take a look at the latest surveillance footage. Let's get back out there and do some righteous invading. What's the problem? Uh, door jam. Again? Let me try. I can do it. Move over, Major Muscle. I can do it. Stand down, Glog. <laughs> you okay? Why must every invasion be this way? Be warned, the Mayday invasion is coming to Cartoon Network. And so begins the crossover event I found during my cheese video, which led me down this crossover rabbit hole. So here we are. This video was originally just going to be about Cartoon Network Invaded, but I figured, fuck it, let's do them all. So the Cartoon Network Invaded crossover event premiered on May 4th of 2007, and this was a five episode crossover event. Aliens had taken over Cartoon Network and they started airing these invaded bumpers leading up to the event to hype up viewers. So when May 4th finally arrived and it was time for the event, this Cartoon Network invaded intro played to show off what episodes we'd finally be diving into. And the invaded crossover began with Cheese A Go Go. This was the start of the invasion, so it's overall a pretty tame episode with more subtle nods to the invasion crossover as a whole. Now, because this episode kicks off the invasion, the crossover aspect is a bit less than the rest of the episodes. So I'm going to highlight all of the crossover aspects of the episode since they're a bit more subtle. And if you want a longer breakdown of this particular episode, check out the Cheese video. But later, not now. Don't abandon me, I'll be sad. We still have a lot to get through. The episode opens up with Frankie mailing off some packages, and this is the first very subtle connection we have. A bunch of these presents we will see throughout this event, so let's keep a lookout for those. She shows up, and Frankie makes the mistake of taking him with her on her errands. He causes a massive car crash and just causes mayhem everywhere they go for the entire episode, including when they go to the movie theater to pick up Blue, who's watching a movie about brain-sucking aliens. Oh, the movie. We'll rent the DVD when it comes out. Ow. Yeah, but what if we're attacked by aliens and get our brains sucked out before then? That movie contained vital information, Mac. Vital brain putty backy information. Later on in the episode, Blue sees a poster and the aliens on it look like Cheese, and he starts flipping out. When Frankie eventually leaves Cheese with Blue to go focus on the fact that one, Eduardo, high as a kite, and Grandma Foster is trying to physically fight a judge, yeah, this episode is absolutely bonkers. So with Frankie gone, Blue starts trying to rebroadcast to the aliens that he has Cheese. This escalates to such a degree that he sends everyone in town into a panic. And then... He breaks into a planetarium or an observatorium or whatever kind of terrium this might be to use their broadcasting system because they would have stronger signals than a bus, obviously. Is this thing on? No! Aliens! Cheese! I got your cheese here! What is taking you so long? So before Blue can get any kind of response, Frankie makes it to the planetarium, observatorium, thingamabobber, battered and beaten, and she drops Cheese off at home before picking everyone else up from jail. Yeah, everyone got arrested, and to top it off, the episode ends with the aliens flying down near the thingy. The invasion has begun, and it is all Blue's fault. So outside of the presence that we'll see periodically through the upcoming episodes, these aren't direct crossovers, 
Everything is very subtle and just share three specific themes. One, three-eyed crab aliens. Two, UFO, pretty standard alien stuff. And what could theme number three possibly be? Cheese. It's cheese. Pretty sure that's why they started with Foster's. So Cartoon Network Invaded was supposed to be a sponsored event by Kraft. You know, the mac and cheese dudes. And apparently they backed out at the last minute, but Cartoon Network decided to air the episodes anyways. The rumors are they backed out due to the Billy and Mandy episode, which is the finale, and there is an alternate ending to the episode, which we'll discuss when we get there. Regardless of Kraft backing out of the event, it continued as a normal Cartoon Network event, and after Cheese went a go-go, the Eds are coming. Oh my god, this episode is so damn good. Now my favorite shows of this Cartoon Network era was Billy and Mandy, Courage the Cowardly Dog, which had sadly ended at this point, and Ed, Ed, and Eddie. And let me tell you, this episode is an absolute fever dream. So if you're 420 friendly, you may want to toke up for this next one. The episode opens up during some weird fucking Jimmy dream that just turns into an absolute freaking nightmare. <laughs> and boom, right out the gate, the aliens show up. So Jimmy, from what we can tell, just straight up dies in his dream. And when he wakes up, Sarah blames the nightmares on all the cupcakes he ate, which are in a purple box, very similarly to the one we saw during Cheese a Go Go. But even with Sarah trying to reassure him, he's still on the edge. It kind of seems like he has some kind of alien PTSD or something. And Johnny and Plank find Ralph's house glowing not long after. There's this green creepy glow happening. There's this mist coming out of it. It's pretty spooky. So when Johnny comes back with a burned face, yeah, his face is burned, him and Jimmy are feeding off one another and flipping out, screaming about flesh-eating aliens. This flesh-eating alien's invading Ross House Double D! He said so! He did! I believe you, Johnny. My dream has come true. <laughs> Giant blades will fall, slicing through the earth like a deep-dish flan! It's the end of humanity! Jimmy's the only one who believes Johnny, but then we find out Ed left a note that says at Rolf's need help. So they all start actually getting legitimately worried and send big macho man Kevin over to inspect. And when they get there, they start sweating like crazy. It's as if there's this invisible barrier around Rolf's house making everything extremely hot. And it's a perfect circle, I might add. A perfect circle of melted snow around the house. It looks like a barrier. And things just escalate from here. Holy the cul-de-sac kids go to inspect and they think it's an alien egg that hatched. They all start hiding and freaking out before they run into Ed. Squeezed, shakes pinched, ribs broadened, grizzly faced beings that smell like mothballs! I am so pooped. Has he been experimented on? The house is now oozing, and Double D volunteers to research alien comics, and the rest of the kids follow Kevin. Now, as Double D is researching the aliens, things get a little spooky. He meets back up with the other kids who are hiding in a bunker and coming up with a plan. They start building weapons and armor to fight the aliens with, and once they finish, they head back over to Rolf's, and things don't go quite as planned. Sarah goes down first, then Jimmy, next Johnny, then... Zombie aliens from planet Rhubarb states, More than often it is required to bait said aliens with a human female to lure potential flesh-consuming extraterrestrials from their lair. So yeah, they use Naz as bait. But it seemingly works. 
So we get a glimpse of the aliens. They're gross. They look like squids. There's a lot of them. They're dripping. They have tentacles. Hello, fellow neighborhood nothings. And it's Rolf in a squid hat. He says his relatives are visiting and they cranked the heat, which somehow made the barrier, I guess. The green glowing is revealed to be a projector. The smell is the food they're making. And damn, dude, they just left Naz like that. But the episode isn't over. Guys. It was freaking real? I don't even know what's going on anymore, man. So the three themes of this episode was the three-eyed crab alien, which was the silhouette of the squid on Rolf's head. The UFO was obviously right at the end of the episode, and the egg Ed popped out of wasn't an egg. It was a ball of cheese. So they hit all three. Now we're on to my gym partner's a monkey and electricity in the town has completely stopped working. No lights, no cars, toilets still to be determined. When the aliens arrive, they'll disable all mechanical devices to make it easier to suck out our brains. Where'd you read that? A respected scientific journal. This magazine even has a story about the cul-de-sac removal and shows the Eds, which is actually one of the very few times the Eds have appeared in another show. The only other episode being what comes after the invasion event. Now, when they arrive at school, the signs continue. The signs are all around us, Adam. But even with the signs, Adam just doesn't believe it. And then they find out about a new student named Rick, who's convinced everyone he is a brain-sucking alien. Rick spends the episode convincing everyone into thinking he's a brain-sucking alien by talking about... You know, Rick, this place can be rough on a new kid. Especially for a new kid who sucks brain juice! <laughs> and everyone believes him. Well, except for Adam, who thinks Rick is just a normal platypus. Even after he's seen signaling the overlord, setting up lights to the mothership to have a safe landing, and he even puts crop circles on the football field. Now everyone is freaking out and hiding in Adam's locker until they smell some cheese and they realize Rick was in the locker too, just downing hella cheese. How did he get in there? That's a good question. Now not long after, Adam is looking for Rick and he finds this video in the AV room. <laughs> And from there, as the episode progresses, Adam and Rick end up in the water and Rick will just not come back up and he seems to be drowning. We then cut to the principal and the teachers talking about how there is no record of Rick and that he might actually be an alien from outer space. Now, when we make it back to Adam, he eventually caves and swims down to save Rick. <laughs> My lung capacity has increased tenfold on your planet. Adam starts shouting and screaming at Rick to stop pretending, and then this happens. He's okay, I'll stop pretending. Good, cuz. So yeah, Rick is an actual alien that looks just like the silhouette from the Ed, Ed and Eddie episode. Or is he? He comes back up the stairs looking like a platypus again, and he breaks out a juice box called Brain Juice, which makes everyone realize maybe Rick's not an alien. And they all just leave Adam to clean up the mess that was made during all the commotion. Oh, and Rick was just screwing with Adam. He actually is an alien. The animals know, man. The animals know. And as we can see, the themes are becoming more and more apparent as we go. Talk of aliens was throughout the entire episode. We saw a UFO not only in the AV room, but Rick flew off in one as well. He was eating cheese in the locker, and he just straight up transformed into a three-eyed alien right in front of Adam. 
things are clearly getting way more serious with this invasion. And in the Camp Lazlo special, things get serious right away. No, I didn't mean that type of serious. I'm talking about this kind of serious. Hey, come on, Gravity. What's the big deal? <gasps> yeah. The episode just straight up opens with Samson being abducted by the three-eyed aliens, which are revealed to actually be three separate aliens. Samson then asks them if they want to suck his brain out, but that's not what they're here for. We want cheese. <laughs> From here, the aliens begin to torture Samson because he won't tell them where the cheese is, and four hours later, they give up on the torture and debate holding him hostage, but for some reason they just don't think it'll work. I could not imagine why. They then just push him out of the UFO. Like, just bye-bye. Now, just like the episode from My Gym Partner's A Monkey, some new campers have arrived. They're aliens! No, I'm pretty sure they're Canadians. Sweet. There you go, eh? But of course, they look just like the fish the alien turned into to prove they were aliens, and Samson starts flipping out. In this scene, we actually see Clam holding one of the other presents from Frankie from Cheese a Go Go. Samson then tries to get the fish campers to do what the aliens did, but they don't, and everyone walks off not believing Samson. Well, except for these three. You think it makes any difference that those vague background characters believe you? Surely you can do better than that, Samson! <laughs> he starts to second-guess himself and decides to go apologize, but he finds them stealing Musili's cheese stash. And him and the three background characters try to stop the fish, and they fail miserably. They succeed in stealing the cheese, and they leave Camp Kidney in a Canadian car. Okay, maybe they're Canadians and not aliens. Everything seems great, but wait, something isn't right here. Better here, Samson! Yeah! The Canadians stole the cheese right under the aliens' noses, so they took off to Acorn Flats, where the second part of the episode begins. Cheese Orbs is the direct continuation that was a part of the same episode block, and the aliens picked the perfect place. It's the International Cheese Ball, but unfortunately, Patsy is allergic to cheese. That sucks. Nina tries to help, but makes things worse, and then the aliens find Nina, who is instantly fascinated by them. So what part of the galaxy are you from? Don't tell me, don't tell me. Zyga 12 Sector Z. So we get a little code name KND not early in the episode, which is a nice touch, and the aliens demand cheese. And when Nina tells them about the cheese ball, and because it's tomorrow, they decide to stay, show off their lasers, and play board games all night long. Patsy and Gretchen show up and catch Nina hanging out and playing board games with the aliens, and then she just kicks them out. The following morning, Patsy and Gretchen try to lure Nina out with various creatures, but it doesn't work. Anyways, it's time for the International Cheese Ball, and Nina is still with the aliens who are on the verge of vaporizing her. Gretchen is feeding all of the cheese to Patsy to make her swell up to look like an alien so that they can win Nina's friendship back, and while she's distracted, the real aliens go inside and they learn all the cheese is gone. I ate all the cheese! You had a severe allergic reaction just for me? The aliens are obviously angry and they fly away, which elicits no response from anyone there. But this does, I guess. There is no cheese. <gasps> And then the episode ends. We made it to the final part of the Cartoon Network Invaded special, and it's time for Billy and Mandy Moon the Moon. 
because the aliens have arrived. Adventure. So Billy goes out searching for adventure and finds Spurg making crop circles, but that doesn't last too long. So they get abducted clearly and the experiments begin, including this absolute nightmare fuel. Ooh, that's better. My insides get really warm sometimes. Maybe that's why Kraft pulled out. Billy gets home, battered and beaten, and his mom notices that all her milk and all the cheese is missing, and she starts flipping out. Now, when Mandy comes over with Grim and says the same thing, Billy tells us the alien's true plan. Yeah, aliens are using mind control to steal our dairy products because they used up all of the cheese on the moon. Billy, did your brain fall out again? They don't believe him, but it's okay, because he brought the whole UFO back with him as proof. So it's hard to believe we missed that on the way in. He crashed into the house. They head inside and inspect, and Billy starts telling them what happened. He even goes full-blown kung fu mode to save Spurg, allegedly. And I don't know if this actually happened, but he beat the crap out of them and swallowed their alien death goo. Let me repeat that. He swallowed their alien death goo. And he beat them with a towel while he was naked. Maybe that's why Kraft pulled out. We find out they also made Dr. Brainiac come back to life, and they planted a bomb inside Spurg's head, and he has 12 hours until his head explodes, and it's his birthday. Luckily, Billy knows everything this episode, apparently, though. Oh, that's oblivious. It's an army of alien werewolves from the moon who need cheese to fuel their war machines. Right. We have to mine the moon of all its cheese, and we need cheese to survive. And when the aliens drop off a gigantic present, the military just takes it as a peace offering and leaves, just in time for this tiny creature inside the present to become this horrifying creature who seems to shoot cheese out of its armpits. So I ask, why the fuck do you need the Earth's cheese? No, it's processed cheese spread. Oh, all right, that makes sense. Billy also comes up with these crazy costumes, but of course is shut down by Spurg, Mandy, and Grimm, and then Grimm tries to come up with a plan during the commercial break. And I don't know what his plan was, but they got kidnapped and now they're in space. So we learn in more detail the aliens plan finally. They're gonna become werewolves, kill all the humans on earth and replace them with these cardboard cutouts. We got number two, Ed, Mac and Blue and even Dexter from the backside. They all get tossed into a coliseum to fight one another not long after. And they just run around in circles trying to avoid Spurg because well, he's got a bomb in his head. You bore us. This is like watching soccer. Release the moon beast! The beast then, for some reason, starts singing and playing music, so they all manage to escape. And meanwhile, back on Earth, Irwin's arm falls off due to lack of calcium. There's a lot of reasons Kraft may have pulled out because of this episode, huh? Our main squad then hitches a ride on a spaceship to confront the aliens. I programmed the moon building robots to work twice as fast. So the ship will never make it to Earth before the full moon. I never saw you reprogram any robots. Of course you didn't. Do you know how boring it is for the audience to watch someone reprogramming a robot? Which didn't do much because they transform into werewolves anyways and they actually do get Billy and turn him into a werewolf too. He ain't looking too hot and he's woofing. Yeah, he's a werewolf. And right as Spurg becomes a decent person. But you stay here. I know what I gotta do. Grim finally turns into the Cheese Reaper and turns Billy and Mandy into dairy superheroes. Billy was right about literally everything. Oh, and Spurg's head blows up. It, like, actually. So he's just headless now. And the force of dairy justice becomes galactic superheroes. And Billy just went back home as his new werewolf self. And during the credits, we get to see that Frankie sent the new living Dr. Brainiac a birthday present which makes Dr. Brainiac so angry, he wants to destroy the Earth. And that's where the episode ends. Unless you're watching the one with the alternate ending. That's right, there is an alternate ending, which is not technically available in any of the current ways to watch this series, legally speaking. So the aliens are covered in yogurt, and their commander is not a happy camper that there's no cheese. One of the alien asks why they don't rebuild the moon with their armpit cheese. So they do exactly that. They rebuilt 
the entire moon. And somehow, in that process, they did not realize they would sink in the spray cheese. So now they gotta eat their way out, but that is not all. Does anybody else smell cheese? Hey, don't look at me, I didn't cut it. And this, this ending, I feel like just adds an extra level to the crossover that's needed. Having the Frankie present is nice, but adding the kids next door hanging out on their moon base is such a fun extra moment, even with how short it is. And you don't get that if you just watch the episode through proper channels. You have to find it through a YouTube video like this or being a pirate. And the craziest part is there's more. And this is such a great way to wrap the crossover episode up. So we're watching the whole damn thing. Strap in. What happened out there? Operation Let's Get Some Cheese was a flawless plan. And somehow, you idiots managed to foul it up. Well, sir, I have analyzed the film of our operation, and I have found key areas where the Earthlings outsmarted us. For instance... We have discovered providing towels for our test subjects is not a good idea. We also learned the Earthlings are quite resistant to our undi-snapping torture. Apparently they built up a tolerance for it on each other. Barbarians, which they in turn used on us, to great effect. Well, what about our undercover agents? Hmm, sadly to say, sir, each one failed to achieve their primary target. So how are you gonna fix this mess? We need our cheese! The Earthlings are obviously more mentally superior than we thought. So, we have a plan B. I have abducted five typical Earthlings. We'll suck their brains and drink their brain juice to gain their knowledge. Well, what are you waiting for? Start sucking! Yes, sir. It's working, sir. That's funny, there isn't much- GIVE ME THAT! How do you feel, sir? Uh, just fine, thanks. What happened? Whose brain did you suck? Oh, these guys! You idiot! None of those stuff have a brain among them! Hey! This moon could use some comic relief! Don't you agree, sir? Yes! Now, I don't know about you, but I loved the crossover event, and I just wish we got more. But the crazy part is, Era 2 still has one more crossover, and it is freaking awesome! The Grim Adventures of the Kids Next Door. An absolutely perfect crossover episode after that finale to Cartoon Network Invaded. And such an incredibly strong way to close out Era 2. The episode opens up with Billy trying on his dad's lucky pants. Lucky pants he should not be touching because his dad will sell his organs if he finds out. Billy's words, not mine. So Billy is freaking out and he calls the Ed Boys of all people. What do you mean you're broke? Hey, if you're looking for charity, call kids next door. They're cheap. We then have this absolutely incredible crossover intro. I mean, come on. The episode has barely started and Billy has met the KND, asked about the Powerpuff Girls, and we even got a custom intro specifically for this episode. So number one mentions that they normally stay away from Endsville because of all the weird stuff that happens here. Billy explains the issues, but they can't get the pants off, so they send Billy with the rest of the KND 
off to the lab to try and remove the trousers. And number one had this absolutely ridiculous disguise going on, but let me tell you, his Billy impression is honestly not too bad, and it probably would have worked on Billy's dad, but Mandy shows up instead, and she slaps the ever-loving shit out of number one. Please, no more, I'm begging you. Mandy tortures number one not long after and eventually steals his glasses before leaving to search for the kids next door. And Billy, well, he gets dragged to an emergency mission to stop the delightful children from down the lane. But of course, in typical Billy fashion, he causes an explosion, which you just know is going to be a problem. Grim is convinced Nigel's Billy, but then... No! You've got to help me, Billy! Horrible children have fused with me sight. I can feel it. They're evil and strangely delightful. What did you say? So the delightful Reaper has arrived and its power is just too great. And they instantly take out number two. So things have gotten really bad. But to add even more chaos, Mandy shows up to the KND moon base dressed as number one. And everyone except for number five actually believes she's number one. So much so... They listen to Mandy's commands to lock number five away in quarantine. Billy seems to be the only person who is able to break free every now and again from the delightful Reaper. And when we get back to Mandy and the KND, she has already completely taken over as Supreme Commander. In the meantime, I'll be taking over as Supreme Commander. The KND will be renamed the MND. The mean, nasty doggies? The big rubber toilets? No, you dolts. Mandy, new dictator. Number five luckily escapes, and Grimm and number one are on their way to the KND moon base, which has seen a bit of a makeover to say the least. We also finally learn what Mandy's actual plan is. She wants to take over the world, and with the technology and army the kids next door have, she feels its wasted potential. And she's going to use that to become dictator of the world. Duh. But when Mandy realizes MND bases are under attack by the Delightful Reaper and that Billy is a part of it, the true fight is about to begin. Number 5 rescues Number 1 and Grimm from prison so they can head to Earth to try and stop Mandy and the Delightful Reaper using the Bone of Barnacles. <laughs> hey. Oh, I forgot to mention, this might hurt a bit. But before they even get there, a gigantic Mandy robot shows up to fight the Delightful Reaper, but it is not equipped for a fight with a mythical being of this caliber. Mustard cannons are not going to cut it. But this, this just might do it. You with the pants! I've come for Miss Sight! And I've come to rescue the kids next door! And I've come for the all-you-can-eat pancake breakfast! It's an intense fight and the pants are protecting them because apparently they're immune to lasers, mustard, and supernatural energies. Somehow. It's up to Mandy. All she needs to do is pants the Reaper. But instead, she allows them to assimilate her. Her will was so strong, she took over instantaneously. And of all the things that could have ended this fight... It's Billy's dad who pants to the Reaper and allowed Grimm and Number One to deal the final blow. So the day was saved by Billy's dad, I, I guess. Mandy drops the Scooby-Doo reference. And I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you meddling kids next door. Before escaping, Grimm breaks the fourth wall and Number One gets dragged off by Billy's dad, who for some reason is not only on the moon, but proved me right, he did mistake him for Billy. Billy then pretends to be number one and gets a bunch of stuff thrown at him. And then during the credits, they just hooked it up. Oh my God. We got Ed, Ed and Mandy, Evil Camp Carne, Class of Number 3000, my gym partners, a man dark samurai, Mac, which is definitely my favorite. And this incredible crossover was followed by the nudes era of all things. Now, I don't really remember the nudes era personally, but from the research I did for this video, this seems to be a very divided era. Now, I do think I like these more than the powerhouse bumpers, but they can just not compare to Cartoon Network City for me personally. And from here, the rest of the 2000s pretty much closed out with that forgetful live action era Cartoon Network reel, which I don't know if anyone looks back fondly on that. 
We've now made it to the 2010s, and there's actually a ton of crossovers between Era 3 and current time, but they might not be the ones you'd necessarily expect. Now, the first half of the decade was pretty much ran by Scooby-Doo and Ben 10, and since I'm currently making my way through Ben 10 on my group reaction channel, Sorta Stupid, I will go through any Ben 10 crossovers and where they fit on the timeline. But I am going to avoid diving too into those to avoid spoiling myself. And since this video is already over an hour long, I am going to hit on the crossover movies, but we won't be diving too far into them, because if we did, we would be here until the end of time. So with that being said, we kick off the first crossover of the decade, which was between Scooby-Doo and Batman the Brave and the Bold. It's the third segment during an episode called Batmite Presents, Batman's Strangest Cases. The episode opens up with the Mystery Inc. gang going to see Weird Al's live performance, just to find it empty because of a phantom who scared everyone away. When the gang gets to unmasking the phantom, it's revealed to be... <laughs> the Joker? The Joker? <laughs> so yeah, the Joker and the Penguin hang the gang over a pool of sharks, and then they hypnotize Scooby into eating the snacks, which would then lower the gang down into the sharks. They leave as villains do before they actually perish, and of course, Batman and Robin show up to save the day. And then they interrupt the episode to tell the people watching what to do in case you were involved in a shark attack. I I'm not kidding. I don't really know why they did this. The gang works alongside Batman and Robin to stop the villains, and it feels very much like a Scooby-Doo episode, before Batmite interrupts the episode for the second time already to give Batman, Robin, Joker, and Penguin magical powers, which makes them all significantly stronger, and they just start kicking the shit out of one another, while Scooby and Shaggy cower in fear, until Batmite gives them powers too, and we get to literally see Scooby and Shaggy kick the crap out of Joker and Penguin. Oh, and let's not forget. Hey guys, look what I found. Weird Al. So the villains have been thwarted and Weird Al takes the money to turn the theater hall into, well, this. Into the Polka and Novelty Song Hall of Fame. Or we could like split it up. We get confirmation Batman also likes Polka, so there you go if you ever wanted some extra Batman lore. And the gang dances with Weird Al to Polka until the episode ends. Next, we have another Scooby-Doo crossover, but this time a Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated episode, Mystery Solvers Club State Finals. The premise is pretty simple. Scooby is sick, and because of that, the gang can't attend the Mystery Solvers Club State Finals. He falls asleep and has a dream that they went to the competition and you get a flood of old Hanna-Barbera mascots at this event. This giant fire demon of death shows up and decides to kidnap everyone but the mascots. And it's up to Scooby-Doo, Jabberjaw, the Funky Phantom, Speed Buggy, and Captain Caveman to work alongside the principal and Angel Dynamite for some reason to save the day. Scooby finds a clue not long after, which leads them to find everybody as guinea pigs. Shaggy, can you hear me? Or maybe it's not them. Things eventually escalate to a boat chase where Captain Caveman blasts through the boat, causing it to crash, which then becomes a car chase where the principal throws the guinea pigs from earlier at the truck. Yes, she actually just yeets the guinea pigs at this truck. They're fine somehow. And th this episode is absolutely unhinged. The mascots work together to save everyone and they trap Infernicus. And it turns out he was the funky phantom all along. Go figure. The next crossover is a Ben 10 and Generator Rex crossover. No, not that one. That is Ben 10 2016 and Generator Rex crossover. Yes, there is two Ben 10 Generator Rex crossovers. And yes, they're both from different versions of Ben 10. This one is for Ben 10 Ultimate Alien and Generator Rex. So, now like I said, I'm watching Ben 10 for the first time alongside my friends on our group reaction channel, Sorta of Stupid, and I don't really want to spoil myself since we've only reached up to Alien Force. So, I still want to make sure I mention any crossovers that happen, 
even if I'm going to avoid diving deep into them. Now, this one is a double episode crossover, which is pretty cool, and being made by the same team, Man of Action, it's just really cool to see this crossover come to fruition. And I've heard nothing but good things about Generator Rex, and Ben 10 is definitely a fun time, so let me know your thoughts about Generator Rex down below and if I should check it out. We then get another Scooby-Doo, but with a Dynoma and Blue Falcon movie crossover of all things, we're getting all kinds of old stuff. Now, I don't know if this counts, but we also got this weird Adventure Time Futurama crossover. What time is it? Time for you to shut up! And it's just amazing getting to see John DiMaggio interact with himself. And then we get another Ben 10 crossover episode, this time between Ben 10 Omniverse and the Secret Saturdays crossover. Now, unlike Generator Rex, I had never heard of the Secret Saturdays prior to researching this video. It seems it came out in 2008, which was around the time I started high school, and I kind of stopped watching cable TV around that time as well. I've been exploring newer cartoons recently though, like I said earlier, such as Adventure Time, Gravity Falls, Steven Universe, and more, and it's been a ton of fun. But with this being another Ben 10 crossover, I will be skipping over this one, but please, I'd appreciate any input on Secret Saturdays as well, so I know if I should check it out on its own. Ah, yes, the Teen Titans Go and OKKO OK era begins. Now, I'm not kidding. We have 13, 13 Teen Titans Go crossover episodes and five OKKO OK crossovers. But don't worry, there's quite a few other crossovers sprinkled throughout as well. So let's do this. Teen Titans Go Let's Get Serious is a crossover with Young Justice. And let me tell you, as my first introduction to Teen Titans Go... Well, actually, it's exactly what I expected. Today, evil will fall to its knees. Today. <laughs> How many times do I have to tell you to not make fart noises when I am striking fear into the hearts of the enemy? Young Justice shows up and is basically the exact opposite of the Teen Titans in this version. Serious, taller, drastic art style differences, and then Aqualad just shits all over Robin and the Teen Titans before storming off. Good day. But I said good day. Okay. Robin gets the Teen Titans riled up because of this. He's going through his Batman depression stage, and it's time to get serious. It is time to get really, really, really serious. So yeah, I don't know about you, but I am grossed out and disgusted. I don't know what it is about this type of art style, but I absolutely hate it. It makes me really uncomfortable. I don't know why, but it does. This new serious Teen Titans beat the ever-loving crap out of the hive. And then this happens. So with Aqualad impressed but worried they might be a little too serious, and you know what? I'm just gonna say it. He's right. They start freaking out right after this. Raven snaps. The Teen Titans fall apart as we get these even more disturbing close-up shots, and the Teen Titans break up. That's it. The episode's over. So yeah. You could say that was a crazy first experience to Teen Titans Go. This is the first actual episode of Teen Titans Go I've ever watched. But it did get my attention, though. And luckily for me, the next crossover Teen Titans Go is with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So it's pizza time. And now I'm hungry. Seriously, we just get like two full minutes of just seeing them act crazy and devour pizza over and over again. I have never wanted pizza more in my life. I'm going to go make some pizza. I had to do it. I have no choice but to institute a pizza ban. <gasps> well, I guess I made the right decision. It only took two weeks for the Teen Titans to decide to drink toxic ooze so they can turn into mutant turtles to hang out with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Hey, lack of pizza will make people do crazy things. And with all the pizza in the world now gone, the TMNT are clearly the culprits.
The Turtles and the Titans get into a massive brawl over the pizza, and the Titans take a pretty massive beating. Before, they just decide to run around like psychos, and they defeat the Turtles with ridiculousness, random, and goofy attacks. They're just being ridiculous, and they... they I don't, I don't get it either. I mean, Cyborg literally beats one with an extendo ass. That actually happens. So that's the entire episode. And I don't know if this actually counts as a true crossover necessarily. I mean, they clearly never actually use the words Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We're just trying to be cool, youngish, mutated karate turtle dudes. There's references galore in the lair, don't get me wrong, but it's pretty obvious it's not like an official crossover, but it's close enough and it was a really fun episode, so I felt the need to include it. Now it's time to take a short detour because Uncle Grandpa has appeared in a Steven Universe episode and this episode, from what I can tell, is almost unanimously disliked by the Steven Universe community and to be honest, I don't really understand why. No, I'm not saying it's a top-tier Steven Universe episode, because it isn't at all, far from it, in fact. But Steven Universe was a show that I won't lie, I judged for a long time based on the look. I wasn't sure about Steven as a main character, but I can confidently say, after finishing the entire show on Sorta Stupid recently, it has become easily one of my favorite newer cartoons that I've seen. It doesn't start this way, but the show gets extremely deep as it continues on, covering fairly serious and dark topics throughout with a riveting story that just pulls you in. But it does have its more cartoony episodes that aren't as story focused, and that's where this Uncle Grandpa crossover comes into play. This episode doesn't really follow any of the rules in this show's universe. Uncle Grandpa pretty much just destroys reality consistently the whole episode. Now, they even put this April Fool's part in the episode, which is a little weird since the episode actually released on April 2nd, the day after April Fool's Day. My guess is it was originally supposed to air on April 1st, but was a day late for whatever reason, or they're just trolling everybody. Anyways, I feel like Steven Universe would have benefited from so many other crossovers over Uncle Grandpa, but overall, it's a fine episode. I don't really see myself watching this one if I ever sit down to do a full rewatch of Steven Universe again, but just because it doesn't really seem to be canon in any way, shape, or form. Especially with all the consistent reality-breaking moments that don't really seem to fit the world. Kinda like this. That's right! He's not just your Uncle Grandpa, Steven! He's everyone in the world, Uncle Grandpa! And when he comes to town, you're sure to have a fun time! Oh, we're in space! Although if you're a fan of seeing Pearl absolutely lose it, let me tell you, this is your episode. We'll never escape! This is our new home! Oh, pal, you're overreacting. I'm not overreacting! Seriously, though, what the fuck is Uncle Grandpa? Bye-bye! What's really interesting, though, is right at the end, after Uncle Grandpa flies off, we see him going through a checklist that has a ton of other Cartoon Network characters, ranging from Dexter from Dexter's Lab to Finn from Adventure Time. And I don't know if this is foreshadowing, because prior to this episode, these crossovers with Uncle Grandpa did not exist. That is, until Grandpa episode Pizza Eve. Well, kind of. This episode is a two-parter, and the first 8 minutes and 20 seconds are something else completely, before Uncle Grandpa literally melts and we cut to the Grampies. A three-minute segment where we get a flood of Cartoon Network characters. Ben 10 from Ben 10 Omniverse, Gumball, Samurai Jack, the Powerpuff Girls, Finn and Jake, Billy, Mac, Dexter, Dee Dee, Johnny Bravo, and even Mordecai and Rigby. Legit. The only crossover regular show ever received, which is insane when you think about it. Well, that is if you don't count the Adventure Time cross regular show six issue comic book crossover, but that's something completely different and a whole other can of worms. There is a ton of crossover comics for these characters that you would probably never expect. Seriously, 
this rabbit hole seemingly goes on forever. There is an insane amount of crossover comics and even crossover deck building games. Maybe one day I can go through all of these, but today is not that day. So back to the Grampies, Uncle Grandpa basically gives himself the award, then he does it again. Well, what do you know? Uncle Grandpa! Whoa! I can't believe it! This is bunk! Let's save this moment for posterity. Oh yeah, and again. And this continues for the rest of the episode until it ends. Moving back to Teen Titans Go! We have a crossover with the 2016 Powerpuff Girls, and it pretty much opens as a Powerpuff Girls episode. <laughs> the city of Townsville will drop to its knees when I, Mojo Toto, unleash my army of cybernetically enhanced battle monkeys. But the Powerpuff Girls obviously show up to stop him, and they succeed in thwarting his plans. That is, until he gets to a dimension where superheroes don't battle villains. A world where superheroes do not battle villains? What kind of awful place could that be? He ends up at Teen Titans HQ, and ends up partnering with Cyborg and Beast Boy to help him make his monkey army. Robin, for some reason, is able to hear the narrator, and then the Powerpuff Girls show up. The Powerpuff Girls? That's right. How did you know? The voice. The voice. Now reminiscent of the last Powerpuff Girls crossover, the Teen Titans treat them, well, like babies. Because you are tiny, helpless babies. No! So the competition begins after the Powerpuff Girls mock the Titans because it's time to see which hero team is superior. All while Cyborg and Beast Boy are literally helping Mojo Jojo create his monkey army. They even let Mojo Jojo nap while they finish the army for him. So I think it's already clear who's winning here. <laughs> Blossom upstages Robin and then things escalate just a bit to say the least. And from here, Buttercup destroys all the lasers while Raven just stands back and watches. And then they mock them for being immature babies. Mojo Jojo traps Beast Boy and Cyborg, and the rest of the gang, including the Powerpuff Girls, are pretty much convinced that Robin has lost his mind. Because he keeps talking about the narrator speaking to him. And to top off the episode, we get to see Robin, Raven, and Starfire dressed as the Powerpuff Girls, and the Powerpuff Girls kick the crap out of Mojo Jojo, and Robin even finally acknowledges them. Finally! But also claims victory after the girls say they couldn't have done it without them. So, you know, it's par for the course for Teen Titans Go. And so, once again, the day is saved. No thanks to the Teen Titans. Seriously, what is wrong with those guys? And now it's on to the weirdest crossover Cartoon Network has ever done, if you ask me. And surprise, surprise, it's another Teen Titans Go! episode, but this one you cannot watch in normal ways. The episode team building is actually a LEGO Dimensions episode. Yeah, you remember LEGO Dimensions from 2015? Toys to Life took over the world, and LEGO had to get in on the game. They had a ton of playable characters and worlds that includes Cartoon Network properties. We had Adventure Time, The Powerpuff Girls, Scooby-Doo, and Teen Titans Go!, and they all have their own playable characters and levels. But the reason I'm talking about this is because in the Teen Titans pack specifically, there was an exclusive episode of Teen Titans Go. That's right, a full 11 minute dedicated episode, which you could only watch by buying one of these packs and playing the game or, well, watching it on YouTube. But this episode is honestly an incredible crossover and absolutely worth watching. The episode opens up with them playing with Legos until Raven teleports them into the Lego dimension. Oh, what happened? Oh man, everything's all brick shaped and stuff. Dude, my hands are like claws, but I ain't even a lobster right now. They get a call and when they go to see what's up, you hear the iconic Gremlins music kick on because the Gremlins are terrorizing the city. Then the Powerpuff Girls show up next. The Powerpuff Girls? You guys again? I thought this city looked familiar. You nice superheroes will help us gather up the rest of them, won't you? Based on our last team up, I wouldn't count on it. But the fun doesn't stop there. Wow, I guess it would be pretty cool to meet Beetlejuice. Who? Beetlejuice. One more time. Beetlejuice! <laughs> Whoa, that was crazy. 
And shocker, the Teen Titans ditch the Powerpuff Girls to go fool around in the Lego dimension, and we get a rapid fire flood of crossovers. The Wizard of Oz, the Goonies, Lego Batman, and even Fantastic Beasts. And it doesn't go all that well, to say the least. What are you guys doing here? The Goonies are mad at me. The Land of Oz believes that I am the evil. Let's just say my building skills need a little improvement. So what about Raven? Where is she? <laughs> Beetlejuice possesses Raven's gargoyle in an act of betrayal. Starfire builds a mech and Beast Boy builds this insane flying car. And then Raven brings out a magic book and all three of these items can be played in the game too. So with Beetlejuice defeated, Things are back to normal, or maybe not. Don't see any reason to leave in a hurry anyway. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> the Titans go back to their dimension and we learn Raven won the Lego building competition and then the episode ends. This episode was incredible, but the icing on the cake is being able to go play in this world after watching the episode. It's just an absolutely incredible experience. You can fly around Jump City and explore. There's missions and side quests. And even though it's Lego, the game is a lot of fun. And although this was the only Lego Dimensions crossover episode we got, you can also play as the Powerpuff Girls and explore their world or play as a bunch of Adventure Time characters and play and explore the land of Ooh 2. So if you're a fan of Teen Titans Go, Adventure Time, Powerpuff Girls, Scooby-Doo, or just Lego in general, I 100% recommend checking this game out. But unfortunately, it is a bit pricey to hunt down, but if you have the extra cash and this looks like fun, I do recommend it. So the first chunk of the Teen Titans Go crossover episode, Bonanza, has passed, and now it's on to OKKO's OK Time to Shine. The Hero's Fate is a crossover episode between OKKO OK and RPG World, which is a comic and, at least visually, clearly inspired by Final Fantasy VII. Even the logo for this episode. So even though I personally hadn't heard of this comic prior to this video, I'm sure this was an incredible moment for any fans of RPG World to finally see this character animated and come to life. KO, who's on the verge of leveling up, wants to continue grinding while the squad wants to take a break since they just took down a parking lot filled with robots. KO gets jumped pretty much right away, but Hero gives him some tips and they take down the monster pretty easily. But things escalate a bit when more monsters show up. Hero is basically teaching KO about the grindy nature of RPGs, and we think we learn here that KO isn't much of an RPG fan. He's exhausted and ready to rest, but... There's still a hundred floors full of enemies and traps to scale. No, 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 no! And it's finally time for the boss, and both Hero and KO are struggling a ton. They get the crap kicked out of them, and not to mention in typical RPG fashion, there's three stages to this boss, and they're still on stage one. KO realizes that he's not having any fun, and decides to leave, which made Hero and the villain realize they don't even know why they're fighting to begin with. We could always fight some other time. And use the time in between to get back to redecorating my kitchen! Hero leaves, but the villain is sadly stuck there. He just wanted to decorate his kitchen, damn it! Hero and KO have a moment, if you can even call this a moment. Good luck with everything, KO! I love you! Okay. Huh? Hey man, don't say it if you don't mean it. Oh, and then the episode ends with Hero being in a comic again, and he bangs his girlfriend, and they have a baby named Spaghetti, and they all live happily ever after and adventure together. I, at least I think. I don't know anything about RPG World, so maybe they all die. Now this next episode opens up a little differently, and this is definitely a crossover I did not expect. Dr. Blight, an eco-terrorist from Captain Planet, shows up in Lord Boxman's office. I'm guessing this guy is one of the villains of OKKO. Okay Dr. Blight wants Boxman to destroy the ecosystem through pollution. Shocker. I mean, come on. It's, it's a Captain Planet crossover. With the goal to ruin the climate and destroy the world. But Boxman brings up kind of a good point. Yo, why would we want to do that? We do live on the world. Who cares? <laughs> and that escalated quickly. Best part of climate change is no one believes it's real. <laughs> you know what? The messed up part is she's totally right. 
So the world is completely polluted, there's smog everywhere, it's boiling out even though it's winter, and there is litter everywhere. But just in time, Kwame shows up with four power rings to help save the day. He gives the red fire ring to Rad, he gives Enid the ice ring, he gives KO the heart ring, and he also gives the last ring to these two random dudes. They get the wind ring, and they summon Captain Planet which was just such a rush of nostalgia. God, I have not watched Captain Planet in literal decades. I also learned today that Captain Planet is the Suckmaster 9000. That's really nasty. Boxman blasts him with a weapon and they send him back into the power rings. They all get into a fight and Kwame gets a little too real here, dude. In fighting, this is why all the original Planeteers left to get real jobs. We are doomed. And it's up to KO and the power of heart to motivate them, which lets them resummon Captain Planet, and he easily defeats them, and the Earth is back to normal. Or maybe it's not. Kwame and Captain Planet get actually very serious for a moment, and we change back to the more traditional Captain Planet art style, where they give tips on things most kids can do to help with climate change and the environment and everything. It's a nice touch for a crossover with Captain Planet. It's about what you would expect. And I will say though, seeing KO in this art style, to be honest, I don't know how to feel about it. The rest of the OK cast did look all that weird, but I don't know, man, something about KO looking like this just messed with me. And we do take a little bit of a break away from OK KO crossovers here though, because the movies Scooby-Doo and Batman the Brave and the Bold released on January 6, 2018. Real creative name you came up with there, Scooby-Doo and Batman the Brave and the Bold. You'd literally just combine the titles together. And from there, we get what may be the weirdest crossover we'll be talking about in this entire video. And that is Adventure Time cross Minecraft, of all things. The episode Diamonds and Lemons opens up with this absolutely incredible custom opening. And we even get a little Fiona and Kate glitch at the end, which is a nice touch. Finn is in the Minecraft world and he's fighting typical Minecraft mobs before climbing a mountain in typical Minecraft style. He sees Lemon grab in the background and heads home, where Jake is in the mines under their Minecraftified house and digging for diamonds like you do. God damn it, I really want to play Minecraft now. Anyways, Jake just starts yeeting the diamonds into the lava. We all have that friend. And we get to see Gunter Ice King LSP. No, call me by my gang name. Okay, Gravel Gal. And this dude. Lemon Grab is struggling still, and Marceline and Princess Bubblegum show Finn what he can make with the diamond using a typical Minecraft crafting bench to make a rocket. And. Blocks. Are we even surprised? I mean, it's Lemon Grab. And of course, not learning literally anything from the show, they help teach him how to play. Can you tell it was a bad idea yet? Finn stops by Tree Trunk's house for some apple pie and snail! Finn gets pumpkin instead, and Finn rides Mr. Pig while Ice King stalks them. And on their way back, Mr. Pig screws up a little bit, and he looks at the Enderman right in the eyes. You don't do that. Stop it. Oh yeah, and Peppermint Butler shows up too, because, you know, why not? Finn is stuck staring at the ground until nightfall, but LSP is literally so annoying, the Enderman just leaves, and this happens. Ah, hey, you got great ball! Finn makes it home, and Jake just yeets the rest of the diamonds into the lava, and Finn accidentally makes it rain lava, so, you know, a typical night in Minecraft. Honestly, though, I'm a big Adventure Time fan. Even if we're only up to Season 6 on Sorta of Stupid, I would love to have a dedicated miniseries of this. It was a really fun episode that any Adventure Time or Minecraft fan can enjoy. And after watching that and discovering that this actually exists... I know what I'm playing this weekend. 
Now later that year in September, we got a 16 and total drama rama crossover. Although this one isn't like a direct episode or anything, Jude from 16 is just a main character here in Total Drama Rama. Slide time, dudes! Jude, don't! Not with the bear! That bum is gonna need a lot of cream. So if you're looking for some 16 crossover content, you know where to go. The OK Crossover Nexus is next, and holy crap, this one is a doozy. The episode opens up in what looks like Cartoon Network City in absolute shambles. And we see this episode's villain, Strike, blasting at some shadowy figures before trying to choose who to summon so that he can destroy them too. We see Jake from Adventure Time, this guy from Mighty Magiswords, and then he comes across KO and summons him to this world and he's about to kill him, but... Oh shit! Garnet popped off and Ben 10 is here too, but it's the reboot version. I don't know what it is. I just can't get into this art style of Ben. Garnet introduces herself and we get to see the crystal gems. Ben turns forearms and gets the Omnitrix blasted off of him, which traps him as forearms. Garnet then saves Ben and KO and when running away, we see pretty much every single Cartoon Network character you can think of. I'm not kidding. They went absolutely all out here. Man, if Strike X'd all these guys, he must be way stronger than I thought. If all these heroes couldn't stop him, what could the three of us possibly do? I mean, the statues, the posters, you could analyze the characters and references in this episode for probably an hour on its own. I'm not even kidding. And it's Raven from Teen Titans Go, who had her powers taken away by Strike. She joins the new squad and they head off. The new team name is OK Ben Let's Go Universe. Could use a little work, I'm not gonna lie. And as they're flying, because it's the only power Raven retained, flying piranhas show up, and we get to see a Garnet and KO combo attack, and then Garnet goes absolutely beast mode. When they eventually reach Strike's lair, they get attacked, but KO manages to steal his weapon during his long power up, traditional villain stuff, and Ben gets his Omnitrix back, Raven gets her powers back, and Garnet's glasses return, so future vision is back on. Okay, KO, let's be heroes. Yeah, she said the thing! But the team name finally kicks in. What? Okay, Ben, let's go heroes! They start fighting, and Ben's Omnitrix goes on the fritz, which gives us literally the most badass transformation attack I've ever seen. And I'm not kidding. Between the cartoon cartoons theme song music playing, the flood of characters from every era of Cartoon Network. I mean, this is literally Cartoon Network personified. It is absolutely incredible. They defeat Strike, fix Cartoon Network City, bring all the characters back to life. We even get to see the nudes running around in the background. And then everyone goes home through their portals. We do get this fun little Teen Titans gag though, which was nice. Over is over. <gasps> Wait a minute. Zintos! Phew, close call. Garnet and KO then have a sweet moment and Garnet gives KO a Garnet card. What does this mean in OK KO? God, I need to watch this show and find out what these cards are about. But holy fucking shit, this was incredible. This, this right here is how you do a crossover. I mean, I have gone through, I don't even know how many episodes in this video. It's a lot. There's like 40 plus crossover episodes that we're covering today. And in my opinion, this was the best one yet. And it was by a long shot. And the craziest part is, this is a show I've never watched before doing this video. I have not watched this entire show, so I am new to OKKO. OK this is what I want from a crossover. This was as if Cartoon Network City actually happened in an episode, which is something I have dreamed about since I was a kid. And the only downfall about this crossover is that it was still just an 11 minute episode. That's it. The only complaint I have is it was not long enough. And I would love to see something like this more often, maybe even with another four different characters. I mean, they all worked well together and were all good choices, although I am partial to the older Ben 10 characters over the new style, but I obviously understand why they went with this specific version. 
Now, my ideal cast of characters for a crossover like this eh, would have to be Billy, Jake, Ed, and Scooby-Doo. Let me know what yours is. But goddamn, did they create something special here? And I will absolutely be starting OKKO OK after this. 100%. The next OKKO OK crossover is one with Scooby-Doo, but more specifically, the Ghoul School. We learn Enid used to go to the Ghoul School, and Tannis, Winnie, Elsa, Sabella, and Phantasma are her old friends. They don't know she stopped being a witch and became a ninja, and it's a pretty fun Halloween episode with some heartfelt moments if you don't count KO, hiding in an urn of ashes. KO and two spooky kids popped out of the ashes, bro. What the fuck is going on? Enid decides to pretend to be a witch, so her old friends don't judge her, and we get a flashback of them together, and Phantasma's reading a magazine with Grimm on the cover, which was a nice little touch to the episode. K.O. tries to mention the ninja stuff, and she tries to change the subject immediately and move on, and from here, they decide to show off their improved spooky powers. And dude, this chick straight up possessed K.O. Yo, they had to drag him off after she was done with his body. Bad girl's powers are also fucking insane. Holy Enid gets her friends trapped by mistake with her powers because she's still holding up this facade and yo, they look like Ed and Nettie. I'm sorry I'm yelling. This episode's kind of nutty. So she finally comes clean and her friends are super supportive. They even pointed out they've known for a while and they have to work together to stop the tree and save their friends. It's so good to be together again. Enid's dad then sees the moon and transforms into a, a, a Chad. I definitely did not expect that at all. We then get the thriller dance and the episode ends. It was a fun little crossover and a fun Halloween episode for sure. Now we're still in OKKO OK territory with this next crossover, but this one being a Mighty Magiswords episode with OKKO OK as the crossover. And to say I was disappointed would be an understatement. Now I'll give the show the benefit of the doubt, and maybe things would have hit better if I knew the characters as the show progressed, but somehow I doubt it. The constant repeating of Magisword. got really old, really quick, but it just gets repeated exactly in that way over and over and over again. Pretty much any time the two main characters attack, it is just Magisword, Magisword, Magis... It, it drove me nuts. Weirdly enough, the side characters seemed as bored as I was during this episode. And as I watched more of the episode, I just disliked the main characters more and more. Now, later on, as the episode progresses, Radicals from OKKO OK is summoned through a portal by one of the Magiswords, and he's pretty much the best part of this entire episode. And all he does is pretty much hit on Witchy Simone pretty much the entire time. But at least it seems to pay off towards the end. We even got to see Radicals use the Magisword, and it becomes what looks like KO's arm if it was like a Keyblade from Kingdom Hearts, which is pretty cool. But yeah. Overall, unlike all the other shows I watched that I've never seen before this video, I actually enjoyed quite a bit, but this one, not so much. All of the other episodes were a lot of fun, but for the first time, I just could not get into this show. And to be honest, I think it's just because of how annoying the two main characters are, and I can't really recommend this episode unless you're like a huge Radicals or OKKO OK fan. And even if you are... Just do yourself a favor and skip straight to 13 minutes and 12 seconds into the episode, which is when Radicals gets pulled through the portal. You will save yourself. I promise. Now, even if you can find this show, because at least in the US, the only way to watch this is to buy it for $2 an episode or $14.99 per season. And that's for standard definition. If you want high definition, you're going to have to shell out $2.99 an episode or $19.99 a season. It would cost you about $80 just to watch this show, at least if you're in the US. And that is insane to me. Also, apparently this episode was the finale. Like th this, this is it. This is the finale of this show. That, that is insane that it was, that, whatever, let's move on. Well, now that that's over, we're back to OKKO OK baby. And the final OKKO OK crossover. And it is with freaking Sonic. <laughs> KO 
is fanboying hardcore, and we learn that KO is a massive Sonic fan. He even draws fan art, of all things. KO, how'd you like to be my new little buddy? New little buddy? Oh, dang. The war is about to begin. And Sonic is here for Chili Dogs, so at least things are consistent in the Sonic multiverse. They chase after Boxman's henchmen to his hideout, and he sets up a custom Sonic stage they have to beat in order to escape. KO's worried it's a trap, and when Sonic tries to teach him to spin dash, it doesn't go too well. Would you mind explaining your technique? But Tails jumps in and ends up having a pretty touching moment with KO, and it manages to work. He spin dashes, collects the coins, and makes it to the next area, where he instantly gets captured in a machine with the Master Emerald, where Boxman insinuates he stole it from Knuckles, or Knuckles handed it over. I'm honestly not sure here. And he transforms KO into Metal KO, and this entire scene from here is incredible. It just feels so Sonic, and the art and animation look so good. Sonic and Tails kick Metal KO into the water, and by working together, they save him and KO's friends, and in the process, they crush Boxman. They then fly off with the Master Emerald, and we get this little gem at the very end, which was just such a nice touch. Hey kids, does this look like fun to you? Even now? Or now? Huh. Life's an adventure! Don't sleep through it! Or you might miss the chance to meet me! And that's no good. So with the OK crossovers complete, we head back to Teen Titans Go! And they actually release Teen Titans Go! vs Teen Titans! And it's a movie! Which is amazing! Now, I'm currently watching Teen Titans on Sorta of Stupid, and the Billy's over there told me there's some spoilers for OG Teen Titans. So I'm gonna wait to dive into this one, but I cannot wait to watch this. This just seems like such a cool and fun idea that I'm sure it's going to be a blast. Now this next Teen Titans crossover is just a giant meme, and it is so self-aware, it's kind of insane, where Control Freak basically points out that Teen Titans Go! is dominating the channel slots, which was completely true. I mean, look at this schedule. Hey, at least we got two Steven Universe episodes, I guess, you know what I mean? He talks about classic cartoons like Johnny Quest, Josie and the Pussycats, and Scooby-Doo, and blames the Teen Titans, and then zaps them into an episode of Family Feud featuring the Scooby-Doo gang. They're the coolest! I love you, Scooby-Doo! Oh, shit. <laughs> And we learn whoever loses will have their show canceled forever. And let the feud begin! Good luck! I'm not shaking your hand! Control Freak obviously cheats to help Scooby and the gang win by twisting what they say so that they just win constantly. But Scooby Doo stops that by saying Scooby Snacks, and there's just no way for him to spin this. And with the Titans convinced they're hated because of Robin's tiny baby hands, he ain't having it. The correct answer is yo baby hands, son. Mm -hmm. Baby great. hands. In your face. Beast Boy and Cyborg enjoy some Scooby snacks, and Scooby-Doo ends up winning Family Feud, and we get a Scooby-Doo style chase, which is amazing. Literally every single show that does this, I enjoy it. Scooby-Doo really is a classic. Oh, and... Uh, Got him. Nice work, gang. So yeah, and they just meme on the show even more. We were inserted into this episode as a cheap ratings ploy, and the Teen Titans are merely trading on the Scooby Gang's good name. And also, what in the fuck is this thing on Fred's chest? Scooby Doo! Scooby -Doo, 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 -Doo. <laughs> <laughs> the Thundercats Roar Teen Titans Go! crossover came next in 2020 to kick off Era 4, and they came out the gate swinging. Thundercats. <laughs> Thunder, 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 thunder cats! Oh! Thunder cats are on the moon. Thunder cats are loose. Feel 
feel the magic, hear the roar. Thundercats are loose. We get to see a Thundercats themed intro. They even show screenshots from the original show, all to celebrate the reboot, which they are absolutely infuriated by. And this weirdly seems like they're memeing about themselves again here. He took one of the greatest action cartoons of all time and turned it into a comedy? I am outraged! Even after Starfire points out they're judging it without watching it, they go as far as to destroy the TV after maybe about a second and a half of watching the reboot. Like, they clearly did not give it a chance. So the Teen Titans decide to go full-blown cancel culture and try to get the new Thundercats knocked off the air with a petition, and they think getting 500 signatures will work. God, I unironically love this show. It is so self-aware. It is insane. We even see a guy with a shirt that says Teen Titans No. We did it! 500 unintelligible angry signatures! Yes! Ah! Ooh, on that creativity! So they send their signatures off to Warner Brothers Animation and they just get completely ignored. Shocker. And Robin flips the hell out. This is about a cartoon, Star! Not made exactly the way we want it to be! Raven then uses her powers to teleport the Titans into the new Thundercats show, and they're entertained, but they still refuse to acknowledge that they like it. They then attack the Thundercats and get their absolute shit rocked. I mean, it wasn't even close, but at least Starfire is having fun. They eventually make up after the original lion -O shows up and praises the reboot, but unlike Teen Titans Go!, which is not only still airing and dominating Cartoon Network to this day, Thundercats Roar only had one season. So the petitions failed and Teen Titans Go! came swinging with a Halloween theme episode later that year. And it was a crossover with Beetlejuice of all things. They accidentally say his name three times and he shows up and they seem to like him quite a bit. Do you think that's funny? Check this out. <laughs> well, that didn't last too long. We even get to see him dressed as Robin, which was fun, but things escalate pretty quickly. Oops, almost forgot. If you want to enter the netherworld, first, you gotta die. Huh? So yeah, I guess the Teen Titans are canonically dead now, and I'm sure those people who made these petitions would be happy. Now in true Beetlejuice fashion, he basically terrorizes the Titans over and over and over again, and the references are strong in this one. There's even a banana boat music segment so they can defeat these two giants so they can get inside the lost spirit's room. Seven foot, eight foot, bunch. After getting inside, they start opening various doors and we see characters from the Beetlejuice movie, sandworms, and even find out Beetlejuice owes Raven's dad money and the Titans go spooky mode. Excuse me, sir. May we please borrow your keys? So they did it. They made it to the Lost Spirits room, and shocker, Beetlejuice betrays them, kicks them inside so he can take over Halloween. The Titans are trapped, but they just go full blown chalk zone to escape. They get into a battle in Beetlejuice, which is actually a pretty cool fight sequence, I'm not gonna lie. And then Beetlejuice gets eaten by a sandworm, and the spirit of Halloween sets everything back to normal. But before this episode ends, Beetlejuice bumps into Raven's dad. Oh, yes. Hey, 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 what are you doing? Stop it! Whoa. Stop it! Stop it! Next up, we have another show I had never heard of prior to researching this video, and that is Victor and Valentino. But it had a crossover with Villainous, which I've actually been wanting to watch. And this opening already grabbed my attention. The characters seem fun, I love the art style and the dark aesthetic, it just looks so good. The main villain I'm assuming, or main character I guess, Black Hat sends Dementia, yeah that's her name, and Dr. Flug off to an alternate dimension to hunt down a giant squid monster. After Black Hat kicks Dementia and Dr. Flug through the portal, Dementia instantly attempts to eat a baby but settles for tacos instead. And they bump into Victor and Valentino, and I definitely prefer the villainous art style here. 
and they both seem like drastically different shows so i'm not really sure why this specifically was the crossover they chose maybe they just lined up right but it just seems like a really weird crossover victor and dementia rob some guy's store Fishy. my god that looks so painful val and dr Fluger are doing nerd stuff while the other two are running around torturing people with salt again they just keep doing this oh yeah and that baby from earlier yeah, it's the squid monster. They stop the squid monster and then Lord Black Hat shows up and Victor and Valentino finally find out they're the bad guys and they help them kidnap a squid baby. Then they zap back to their dimension and that's it. You know, this was actually a really fun episode and I'm going to tell you right now. It absolutely sold me on Villainous. Like, I will 100% be forcing the boys on Sorta of Stupid to watch it with me. The Victor and Valentino, I really, I take it or leave it. I really have no interest in watching that show. Zombies. Back to Teen Titans Go, and more specifically, a Teen Titans Go and a Freakazoid crossover? Because this squishy-headed villain needs to be stopped. And this episode is about as off the rails as you'd expect. The future? Cool! Have you guys taken care of that whole poverty thing? No, but you can watch a movie on your phone while taking a poo-poo. Neato! They work together to destroy the robot guards and break into the evil lair where Freakazoid gets the Teen Titans trapped pretty much right away. And then he ditches them for donuts and coffee with a cop. He makes it back just in time to save them, but Robin does manage to fall in and almost gets eaten. And when they eventually make it to the villains, they unveil their plan to turn everyone into dog people. And then Robin just mocks Freakazoid, and when he says Hugbees, it causes the machine to explode. See, Robin, you don't have to stick to the story when you've got comedy. You're right, Freakazoid. The plot can be an afterthought. So to close out 2020, yes, this was a jam-packed year for Teen Titans crossovers. I mean, they have yet another family feud style episode crossover like the Scooby-Doo one, but this time it's featuring the DC superhero girls. And this isn't the only Teen Titans Go! and DC superheroes crossover. In fact, they have a four part crossover in 2021 and a movie in 2022. So I guess you could say this episode had a positive reception. The DC superhero girls get zapped into the TV universe and then the Titans get zapped inside too. And I will say, I much prefer the crossovers when they retain their original art style of each show as opposed to changing it to fit the crossover and the show they're in. It just makes it feel like a true crossover to me for some reason. Bad Robin? What are you, you doing here? here? We, we got, got sucked into the TV! Stop it! So clearly, we got some beef going on here. Control Freak is just fueling the fire. And because we know there's nothing more heated than Family Feud, it's about to pop off. The Teen Titans get absolutely obliterated yet again, and the episode follows basically the exact same premise here as the Scooby-Doo crossover. The DC superhero girls get every answer right except for one. We move on to the Teen Titans, and Robin fumbles the bag again. Say the laser eyes. Laser eyes, bro. Pew, pew. Hard work and dedication. <laughs> the correct answer was... Laser eyes. I told you it was the laser shooting eyeballs! However, things do change up a little bit after this. All the Titans ditch Robin, the Titans lose, and then Control Freak attacks them with a giant robot. Robin and Batgirl get tangled, but when they decide to work together... Okay, together then. <laughs> they fail again. But luckily, the Poop Patrol shows up last minute and defeats Control Freak with their farts. Yes, th that is actually how the episode ends. I'm not kidding. Next, we're on to yet another Ben 10 and Generator Rex crossover, but this time it's for Ben 10 2016. And the craziest part is this episode dropped on April 10th of 2021. And then the very next day, this insane Ben 10 cross Ben 10 crossover happened where they just had this one big Ben 10 multiverse episode, which just seems like such a cool crossover. 
Unfortunately, like I said earlier in this video, I'm currently going through Ben 10 on the Sorta Stupid channel, and I don't want to spoil myself, so I won't be diving into these deeply, but I wanted to at least mention them and show off some footage. And you know what? I may be missing out on the Ben 10, Ben 10 crossover, but we got a four part Teen Titans Go and DC Superhero Girls crossover called Space House. And I won't lie, after watching Teen Titans Go for the first time while making this video, and more specifically, watching nine Teen Titans Go crossover episodes so far, I am hooked. It's an So obviously from the episode title, it's pretty self-explanatory, but the Teen Titans were invited to the space house with the DC superhero girls. Everyone's pretty excited and getting along, but of course, Batgirl and Robin instantly start arguing. We will have a great time together on our spacecation. Nothing is going to ruin it for us. Isn't that right, Batgirl and Robin? Yeah, fine, okay. whatever, okay. They then all pick their rooms, and they are all amazing rooms, but Bumblebee gets the last one, and something ain't right with this room, yo. I'd be sleeping on the couch, I ain't lying. Especially after seeing that creepy ass tentacle, which is now missing from the tank and in the damn kitchen? Oh hell no. And for some ungodly reason, Robin is eating the slime on the ground from this tentacle monster to prove he's the better detective and he's already starting to break out, so who the hell knows what's going to happen to him before this episode is over. Bumblebee is put into this alien-style mech because Supergirl doesn't fit, and Robin mutated into this weird starfish creature, and they throw the other starfish creature into space. It's kind of lucky it wasn't him. Which, I'm not gonna lie, it's kind of sad because that starfish creature was also invited to the house. Like, they were probably just trying to get a sandwich. That was their room. Bumblebee, you jacked their room, and then they got yeeted into space. Part two of this four-part crossover opens up with the two squads watching TV as you do. Cyborg tries on the Supergirl's earrings and tiara, and Beast Boy goes full-blown golem style and becomes feral. Yeah. The power, Beastie must have it. And you know what? He succeeds at it, and he steals the ring, which lands in Zatanna's magic hat and disappears. And of course, Beast Boy dives right in after the ring, and everyone follows suit. Well, not everyone. Nah, it'd be overkill, and way too many characters to keep track of. Then it's settled. Due to production constraints, we'll stay here and watch more Muffin Wars! Yay! Yay! They all chase after Beast Boy in an attempt to retrieve the ring, but they set off a trap and get captured and almost got skewered. Although Robin actually does get skewered. They manage to escape, and Beast Boy has just completely lost it. <sighs> Give me my power ring! <laughs> he does manage to succeed in putting on the ring and transforms into this gigantic bunny dinosaur creature and uses the immense power of the green lantern ring to make a tater tot hammer yeah that's that is his creative prowess there so if you've ever wanted to see a potato pounding this episode's for you they get the ring back not long after and now starfire is losing it Luckily, into part three, she's back to normal, although it would have been kind of cool to see that evolve over the next two parts, I won't lie. But instead, we have a giant meteor made out of meat, which is hurling towards them. They hop into this simulation that's built into the space house so they could see what they would need to do in order to actually stop the meteor and save them. And let's just say, their plans didn't work out too well. Oh man, can we at least rock out to some Aerosmith? Never! The rest of the simulation also fail, probably because one of them involved making Meat City and the other one was Wonder Woman getting married instead of actually coming up with a plan. And with the meteor approaching, Cyborg's plan is up next. Now it seems to be going well. Or not. They end up crashing into the meatball. The bomb is fine, but the detonator is damaged. So Cyborg stays behind to detonate the bomb. But they did bring his head back, so don't worry. Cyborg ain't dead. So we've had three movie parodies so far. Alien, Lord of the Rings, and Armageddon. I wonder what we're going to get next. 
The space house announces that they are about to arrive at their destination, and it is this giant space skull squid looking ship. And there is a ton of houses with a flood of superheroes and villains just chilling. Nobody's attacking. They're just vibing, enjoying their vacation. So it seems they weren't the only ones invited. Brainiac then shows up. He collects pretty much every single hero and villain that you can think of. They're all pretty much here. And it seems like a sinister plan. But after his mom just kind of shits on him for a minute straight, he becomes way less intimidating and you kind of just feel bad for the guy. And the Teen Titans and the superhero girls, I think, felt the same way because they try to help him out a little bit. We start simple with a handshake. Try to get a job, man. And he absolutely destroys Robin's hand. Now on to a mock date with Kara, and it goes terribly. Well, I'm originally from Krypton. Uh -huh. Boring! Can't we just get to the good night kiss? Here you go. Next, it's time to fix his style. And this specifically went pretty well. He even successfully got a job, went on a date, got a girlfriend. I mean, he is a whole new man. They really helped him out. So he holds up his end of the bargain and he decides to send them all home. But he reveals that now, because he's mature and an adult, he's going to start destroying planets now. So the Teen Titans and the DC superhero girls decide to partner up to try and take down Brainiac with their combined power. And they ain't able to do it. They are not strong enough. But with all the superheroes and supervillains in the entire DC multiverse working together, they succeed in defeating Brainiac. But how are we going to get all these people back home? It's simple. We don't. This is where they live now. That works for me. So yeah, it's confirmed. I am a Teen Titan Go fan. I mean, seriously, this four-parter was special. And just like the Cartoon Network Invaded event, I really wish we had multi-part crossovers like this. We haven't really gotten too many, and I wish they did this more often. And I definitely plan to dive into the crossover movies in the future because there is a ton of them. And I am not kidding, dude. The next three crossovers are movies. We have Teen Titans Go! See Space Jam. That movie released on June 20th, 2021, just under a month before Space Jam A New Legacy released. And this just seems like the perfect crossover. The Teen Titans and the Space Jam characters just seem like they would mesh really, really well. So this is definitely on my list to check out. And we also got the freaking return of Curtis the Cowardly Dog. And more specifically, the only, I repeat, the only dedicated crossover for Courage. Straight out of nowhere, Scooby-Doo meets Courage the Cowardly Dog. It released that same year on September 14th, just in time for Halloween. And yes, I will absolutely be forcing my friends to watch this one with me because I absolutely adore Courage. I mean, hell, Courage was the first video I actually did on this channel. It is one of Cartoon Network's greatest shows, and it was such a bummer it never actually got some dedicated crossover episodes. And the next year, on May 24th, 2022, we got yet another Teen Titans Go! and DC Superhero Girls crossover, but this time in the form of a movie. Teen Titans Go! and DC Superhero Girls Mayhem in the Multiverse. And after getting a taste of the multiverse in that four-part crossover from earlier, this is 100% another must-watch on my list. From here, we get back into the episodes, and We Baby Bears received a crossover with Summer Camp Island called Witches on October 8th, 2022. It's a fun little Halloween episode where the baby bears summon three of the witches from Summer Camp Island by mistake. They pretty much fight over who should fix this to help the witches get home and are attacked in the meantime, which then forces them to work together to save their friends. Now, I don't have any connection to either of these shows. I never watched We Bear Bears, and I didn't even know We Baby Bears existed. And I've also never heard of Summer Camp Island before. Now, this episode didn't really grab my attention all that much. It's definitely one of the weaker episodes I've gone through for this video, but it wasn't bad by any means. I can see the appeal for it. It just didn't personally do it for me. But I want to make sure that it's clear, this is not a Mighty Magisword situation. 
That show I actively did not like. This one wasn't too bad. I might actually put it on for my kids. Fossil Magisaur. Now, when I originally started working on this video, that would have been it, outside of the little secret we have at the very end. It would have been such an anticlimactic ending to the biggest video I've ever made across any of my channels. But apparently, the Cartoon Network gods heard my call. And as of October 14th, 2023, the Teen Titans Go! Warner Brothers 100th Anniversary two-part episode released. The Teen Titans are hosting the 100-year Warner Brothers celebration party. Sweet ride! You're good to go! Move on ahead! Enjoy the party, yo! <laughs> meep, meep. Oh. We get a ton of classic cartoon characters and even Gizmo. Michigan J. Frog even shows up, but he ain't on the list, so he gets the boot. The newer characters start to arrive and the Titans confiscate all their weapons. And with everyone finally there, the festivities can begin. They even go get coffee at Central Perk. I can't believe we're on the set of friends. I am definitely a Rachel. No, Taz Rachel. And I hereby state my claim to the character of Rachel. <laughs> I mean, this crossover is throwing so many things into one, it is awesome. So with the set of friends destroyed, they show off the Warner Brothers shield, which fosters creativity and would destroy Warner Brothers as a whole if it were to be damaged. And of course, somebody is lurking in the shadows. We get to see all of these Warner Brothers characters partying it up for the celebration before Michigan J. Frog is revealed to be the one lurking in the shadows, and he stole the Warner Brothers shield and blew up the power station. I devoted most of my life to this studio. And for what? To be left off the guest list at its most important celebration? He sends everyone except for the Titans, Daffy, Yogi Bear, and the Mogwai to the center of the Earth, so it's more of a fair fight, and he actually succeeds in destroying everything. So it's up to our squad here to go find the broken shield pieces to bring Warner Brothers back. They find the mystery machine in the desert and Cyborg turns it into the mystery monster truck and they head out until they come across this castle. The clock strikes midnight and of course the second Mogwai turns into, well this. I'm a brain gremlin who prides myself on my sensibility and sophistication. They find a locked door, and when the key gets stolen, Robin and Daffy race after the key so that they can open the door. And when they do, they steal the first shield piece from Oz. They find the next shield piece not long after inside this gigantic friend's fountain that's being guarded by these sea creatures. But they're friendly, so to get the shield, they need to do this. <laughs> Moving a couch up to their apartment is hardly a tiny favor. This couch is heavy. Ah! Ow, 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 ow. They drop off the destroyed couch into the friend's apartment, grab the piece, and head off to Blockbuster Island, which has a ton of references. The squad gets kidnapped pretty much right as they get there by these giant bug creatures who deliver them to a gigantic Michigan J Frog who's wearing the final shield piece. They then use Cyborg's nanobots to make this mecha mogwai so that they could fight Michigan J. Frog. And they may have lost the fight, but they succeeded in getting the shield piece. But it does absolutely nothing because the magic is gone. Or is it? The magic isn't gone. It resides deep inside all of us. We are Warner Brothers. They all power up from the power of the studio, defeat Michigan J. Frog, restore things back to normal, and save the day. But we finally learn Michigan Jackson Frog actually was on the guest list the entire time. <laughs> That's all, yo! This newest crossover was awesome, and it had so many characters and references that it just absolutely overflowed me with nostalgia and joy while I watched it. And I have hope for the future. 
I think most of us know that Cartoon Network has been in a bit of a slump over the last few years. And with Cartoon Network Studios shutting down earlier this year to move into the same building as Warner Brothers, it seems a lot of people are skeptical and I think that's a fair feeling. But I personally have hope for the future. This was an incredible crossover, but Cartoon Network isn't done just yet. Warning, this is checkered past. You may feel things you haven't experienced since you were a child, one of which is joy. Welcome to your relaxing journey back in time. Between this crossover and checkered past happening earlier this year, I have high hopes for the future. Going down this rabbit hole really flooded me with nostalgia, and it was such an incredible experience to make this video, and I really, really hoped that it helped make your day a little better, and that you enjoyed this journey through time for one of my favorite TV channels from when I was a kid. If you enjoyed the video, it would mean the world to me if you hit that subscribe button and like the video. It tells me you want to see more content like this in the future, and it helps tell YouTube you enjoyed the video, which will then hopefully share it with others. Now, this is the biggest video I've ever made, but if you want to check out some more Cartoon Network related videos, click any of these on the screen. And if you want even more content, you can check out my group reaction channel, Sorta Stupid. We're currently making our way through Adventure Time, Gumball, Teen Titans, and we even finished Steven Universe recently. So there's a lot going on over there. So thank you so much for watching, and I will see you the next time I upload. Later.